All right, Tony, we're ready. Ready? Okay. <clears throat> good, good evening, everybody. I want to welcome you to Appropriations uh, Subcommittee uh, Conservation Development Public Hearing. Uh, today, we're going to hear from the public for testimonies on the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, uh, the Office of Consumer Council, Department of Agriculture, Department of Economic and Community Development, Department of Labor, Department of Housing, Agricultural Experimental Station and the Council on Environmental Quality. I want to welcome everybody to this is this is really kind of our first hearing. We had one last night, but the the one participant did not come, so we really didn't have one. So this is going to be um, a learning experience for all of us, and I want to thank you for joining. Uh, Senator Austin, would you do you have anything to say? You always have something to say. <laughs> not usually. <laughs> um, but I, I appreciate everybody coming tonight. Let's move this along. Ready to go. Remember, you have three minutes each. Um, Representative France. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I echo the comments from uh, Senator Austin. It's uh, good to have everybody here to come out and uh, have their voices heard and looking forward to the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Senator Minor. Good evening, Madam Chairman. Uh, also looking forward to the public hearing. Thank you. Um, Representative Gibson. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, as Senator Austin said, remember you have two minutes and 59 seconds. <laughs> um, I don't see your co-chair on. I don't see Senator. Um, well, if she does, I'll, I'll let her say a word if she joins us a little later on. So we will start, and I, as my, my colleagues have stated, you have three minutes for your testimony. And I just want you to know, I will, at, after three minutes, um, ask you to sum a, summarize if you haven't started or haven't ended. I realize that because we have over 75 people that are gonna be testifying, and that means it'll be four hours if you do the math. Um, I think on a Friday night, people are going to, uh, understand that it's been a long week. So I appreciate that. And I will go right into the first person. First person is Megan Fontaine, followed by Hel uh, Helen McAlden, followed by Fleur Cindia Montenegro, and followed by Dara Covell, and then Robert Nunez. I believe those are the people of the first five. So Megan, Remember, this is our first year, first hearing, so we're we're getting the bugs out. <laughs> yeah, uh, Madam Chair, she's not here. She's not here. Okay, uh, Helen McAlden. Hi, happy Friday. Yes, happy Friday. Go happy right ahead. Friday. Go right ahead, Madam. Senator Aston, Representative Walker, Representative Gibson. Senator Hartley, Representative Kennedy, Senator Summers, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony tonight on House Bill 6439. I am here to discuss the important investments through the Department of Housing to support efforts to end homelessness in Connecticut. Um, my name is Helen McAlinden, and I am a resident of Fairfield, Connecticut. I have been working with homeless services for almost two decades and delighted to share some of the success, some of the successes I have witnessed over the years, especially since the creation of the coordinated access networks. I am a member of the statewide reaching home campaign to prevent and end homelessness in Connecticut and a board member of supportive housing works, which is the backbone agency for Fairfield County Coordinated Access Network and Opening Doors Fairfield County Continuum of Care. Today I testify on behalf of Opening Doors Fairfield County. We alongside many of, um, of the other partners in the state know that safe, affordable and permanent housing is the only solution 
to homelessness. And I know many of you have been big supporters of supportive housing over the years, and thank you. Um, we all know when our state's residents have stable housing, their economic and healthy health outcomes improve. During COVID-19, the need for permanent housing for all of Connecticut's residents has become even more important than crazy. I am so proud of how our statewide partners, shelter directors, advocates, and you all have come together to support the system to keep our most vulnerable safe. Yesterday at the Housing Committee, you got to hear from colleagues David Rich and Kelly Fitzgerald about the successes of the Coordinated Access Network and the ways we are all working together to keep our homeless population safe. I am proud of this work and glad we um, have the Department of Housing to lead us forward. Efforts like this needs money to get us to where our projected goals to end homelessness is for all. Commissioner Mascara Bruno and her team at the Department of Housing are doing great work. Um, it's amazing the work they're doing. She has rolled up her sleeves and delved into the problems while providing collaborative resources to the system. We, and when I say we, I mean Opening Doors Fairfield County, um, respectfully request that the committee supports the following proposal from the governor's budget for the Department of Housing. We support funding of the Department of Housing um, homeless line item at 85.5 million. You will read in my testimony the full details, but today I'm going to speak to you on behalf of the homeless we serve. Um, they don't have voices sometimes, so I am the voice of um, one particular person, which is, um, his story is very similar to a lot of stories. Helen, um, can, you sum, can you sum up your three minutes are up? Thank you. Um, oh my goodness. Um, so I just wanted to say that how important it is to the people we serve. Um, I had an opportunity to talk to somebody recently at the shelter who um, was moving to permanent supportive housing. He will um, get to have a home like us all. He will get to um, um, have his children back. He will have, be a neighbor. He won't have to go to the emergency room for soup and for all the things that to be warm and um, all the things that are needed. Um, he will get to have a life like all of us. So I please ask you to please, on behalf of the people that we serve, to keep homeless services on top of the line item and um, make sure that we don't have homeless. We're getting so close to zero um, for chronic homelessness. And thank you thank for your support tonight. Thank you, thank you, Helen. Thank you for your testimony. And, and I know it's hard to know three minutes, but three minutes are very hard. So I ask everybody, you don't have to say good morning, good evening to all of us, go right into your issue, say it, and then it'll be a much better, better situation. But thank you very thank much you. For, for your testimony. Have thank a good you. evening, thank you. Uh, Megan Fontaine. Uh, good evening. Um... It's great to um, be speaking with you this evening. Um, I'm so glad that things started early and on time. Um, can you hear me? Go right, go right ahead, Megan. Get right into your meeting. Yes, yes. Um, I'm Megan Fountain. I live in New Haven. Um, I coordinate advocacy and partnerships at ULA, which is a grassroots immigrant rights and worker rights organization. Unidad Latina en Acción, and we are part of the Connecticut Domestic Worker Justice Campaign. Um, and tonight I wanna to tell you about an act concerning uh, wage education and enforcement for domestic workers. Um, this is a bill that would um, help create an education and enforcement program for um, domestic workers who do the essential work that is keeping us alive right now. Um, domestic workers care for children. They care for the elderly, the sick, and the disabled. Uh, they clean our homes. And it has never been more clear uh, that this is, that care work is essential work. Um, for 60 years, domestic workers were excluded from basic labor protections including minimum wage, overtime, sexual harassment, and health and safety protections. 
And it was only in 2003 that the US Labor Department issued a rule that guaranteed domestic workers the right to earn minimum wage and overtime. So the good news is that now domestic workers have the right to earn the Connecticut minimum wage um, and most have the right to earn the overtime. The problem is that there are more than 40,000 domestic workers in the state who do not know that they have these rights um, and employers, many employers also are not aware of, uh, of these responsibilities. Um, so uh, we are seeking your support for a bill that would create a modest, very modest education and enforcement program uh, within the Department of Labor to work together with community organizations to educate workers about their rights, to educate employers, and to make sure that wages are being paid correctly. Um, for more than 10 years, I've worked directly with people who have been underpaid uh, we call this wage theft when people are not paid the minimum wage or when the employer fails to pay the required overtime. And sometimes the employer fails to pay at all. Um, it's a problem that happens every day in Connecticut. It gets worse during an economic downturn. Um, the Department of Labor is routinely under-resourced to tackle the problem. Um, but there is a solution, which is when the Department of Labor collaborates with community groups, um, those community groups that have the ear of the most vulnerable workers um, to work together to make sure that workers and employers um, and the state are working together to make the wage rights a reality. Um, it's worked very successfully in states like California. Um, I mean, it's even worked here in Connecticut. We've, I've had great experiences collaborating with the Connecticut Department of Labor Okay, and Megan, Megan, you have to sum up. And that's it. Um, so thank, thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I see somebody raise their hand, but uh, we were trying to let everybody get through the, uh, the, the, um, the, the testimonies. Okay. Thank you. Um, but thank you very much for, for, your, uh, for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Floricinda Montenegro. She is not present here, Madam okay. Chair. Maybe we'll, we'll come back to her. Uh, Dara Covell. Good, good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening, Chairperson Walker, Chairperson Austin, uh, Senator Minor, Representative France, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the proposed investments through the Department of Housing to support efforts to create quality, affordable housing for all of our residents in Connecticut. My name is Dara Covell. I am the CEO of Beacon Communities. We are a 50-year-old institution with 18,000 apartments in 12 states. My company, my company prides itself on creating, owning, and managing quality living environments for residents, young and old, families and seniors, and people with special needs. Our history as a development company in Connecticut goes back over 20 years with the redevelopment of Monterey Place in New Haven and Southwood Square in Stanford, and now includes over 1,200 apartments across the state. I am also proud to call myself a Connecticut native, Connecticut and New Haven native. Uh, I'm here to share my support for the agency's budget and the 305 million proposed as affordable housing funding under consideration by the General Assembly. And also specifically to thank you for your unwavering leadership in moving these commitments through the legislative process so these dollars can be put to work for residents of Connecticut. The commitment of the legislature, the governor and the Department of Housing has never been more important in the context of the pandemic and associated economic crisis Investing in building quality places for people to call home is not just sensible economic and public policy, it is an imperative. Beacon has a proven track record, um, proven success with these investments through our projects, such as the transformation of Montgomery Mill in Windsor Locks into 160 mixed income apartments. And we are thrilled to be planning for the imminent renovation of Edith Johnson at 114 Bristol Street in New Haven in Chairperson Walker's district that serves 95 vulnerable elderly, elderly residents sorely and the property is sorely in need of improvements. 
These, um, these projects were from previous commitments through the Department of Housing and from the state. We now have a pipeline that includes uh, redevelopment of 50 um, apartments, state, state public housing apartments in Brantford for residents who are elderly and disabled. Our proposal includes increasing that housing in Brantford to 67 modern accessible spacious one bedroom and two bedroom apartments. And it's a groundbreaking partnership between the Brantford Housing Authority Beacon and the New Haven Housing Authority. We are also excited to have the opportunity at State and Chapel in New Haven to create a transit oriented development and add mixed use and mixed income develop, um, apartment building units there. These projects and many more will be made possible by the investment of funds and supported by the Department of Housing. I wanted to recognize the energy, focus, and expertise brought by Commissioner Salem Oscaro Bruno. It has made a big difference to the state to have someone with her talents and background leading the housing policy of the state. We are great, deeply grateful to the state of Connecticut for its continued leadership promoting sustained and meaningful funding for housing that serves lower income residents and generates multipliers of strong economic returns through jobs and investments with every dollar spent. Thank you for allowing me to share my testimony and thank you for your efforts to support and increase the housing opportunities for all Connecticut's citizens. Did it. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you for your testimony. Thanks. Thank you for being three minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. You have, a, have a good evening. You too. Thanks. Um, Florecinda Montenegro. Florecinda, just because, because you came on, I just want to let you know that you have three minutes for your testimony. And I would recommend don't, don't say hello to everybody. Just go right into your, your, your issue. Go right ahead, ma'am. You're muted. Okay. Uh, Hello. Okay. Can can you okay go try it again, Florida? Now you hear me better. Yes, much better. Okay. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm here today to speak in support of an act concerning domestic workers' wage education and enforcement bill. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Florecienda Montenegro. I live in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I am a proud mother of a 15-year-old boy, and I came to this country 19 years ago full of many hopes for a better future for me and my family. Since I arrived in this country, I have dedicated myself to work as a nanny with different families in the Fairfield County area. Many of those families were people who only took advantage of my need to work since not having a law that regulates this decent work or a place to turn for help. I had no choice but to endure the injustice and abuse because I have a family to support. I have been affected by the pandemic, losing my nanny job in March 2020. And I was never recognized with any unemployment benefit as a worker, that's normally. <laughs> I have had to turn the charity of the church for food for me and my family. I am currently dedicating myself to work like as cleaning houses and caring for the daily. Being now an essential worker, putting my health and my family at risk since I do not have the privilege of not working because I live from paycheck to paycheck. I ask you, the authorities, to advocate for us domestic workers. I'm sorry. Okay. We need to have a law that reinforces and regulates our dignified work. We are hardworking mothers and as a head of family, we deserve to be treated and with respect and dignity. I personally ask you to support this act concerning domestic workers, wage education and enforcement bill. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for having the courage to testify. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, Robert Nunez. And after Robert Nunez, Xavier Gordon. After Xavier Gordon, Zeusli Gonzalez. And then Catherine Fiedler, Fleeter, Fleedler, I think. All right. Robert Nunez. Good evening, distinguished members of this committee. I'd like to start by thanking you all for allowing me the opportunity to address you regarding the funding for the amazing program that is Music Haven. My kids have been fortunate enough to be a part of this program for the last six years. My son for six, my daughter for four. I would like to take this time to respectfully and humbly ask you to please ensure that funding for this program is included in the budget. Again, I thank you for your time, and I ask that you help Music Haven continue to bring the gift of music to our kids. Thank you for your time, and God bless. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony, and thank you for, for speaking as an advocate for Music Haven. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, next, we have Xavier Gordon. I just want to remind everybody that you have three minutes, and I say go right to the testimony and talk about the issue as opposed to going through the list of all the, the, the members here in front of you today. Mm, Mr. Gordon, go right ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman. Good afternoon. My name is Xavier Gordon, President of Ask Me Local 269 for the Department of Labor. I have worked at the Department of Labor for 30 years and so have experienced many changes that have hurt my agency over time. When I came to the Department of Labor, we had 19 offices in the state and now we only have five American job centers and two appeal division offices. I often hear complaints due to the lack of offices or distance one must travel to get assistance for unemployment or job service. Those seeking assistance may travel up to 30 to 40 miles to get to an office if they're fortunate. In 2015, I watched as 120 employees had to be laid off and clo uh, offices closed to meet DOL budgetary problems. As part of the closures, we lost our call centers, which was the major frontline operation for unemployment processing. I would estimate that we had anywhere between 70 to 80 people between the two call centers to process claims and answer phone calls. So access to unemployment compensation services were very good, safe and secure to, prior to the closing. Our agency turned to a website online system to provide easier access to unemployment benefits. The term modernization was used to describe this change and the DOL moved forward toward changing our, our computer systems and software. These changes made the public angry and upset over the, uh, over the computerized system because it was not user friendly. Those who do not have a computer found it a struggle, struggle to file for benefits and therefore forced to go into the local office to file a new claim or to resolve their unemployment issues. This is how the five local offices have serviced the public for the last few years. The pandemic changed us all in March, 2020. We at the Department of Labor all became essential employees overnight and was all hands on deck to process unemployment claims. Over the next several months, the Department of Labor hired over 180 people for the newly created contact center and outside vendors were contracted to assist with the federal and state programs for unemployment. Outside vendors now have access to, access to confidential information and personal identification information or PII. Once a proud agency with a very high level of security now has become prey to fraudulent unemployment claims, over 60,000 fraud claims and counting. Imagine if the 120 we originally laid off in 2015 were still here. Could we have better, been better served or could we have better served the citizens of our great state by making better decisions? We have since processed over a million claims and answered thousands of phone calls. Many waited two to three months for their claims to be processed and others are still waiting for their appeals to be heard. I ask as a concerned citizen why we let this happen. Austerity is not the answer here and automation did not make it better. We have seen what privatization has done to cities and states where budgets have gone up and customer service has gone down. Do we as taxpayers really want to end up paying for less access and poor customer service through privatization or automation of state services? We need to look for a financial viable solution. A great start would be to keep and fund the contact center. 
There are 30 states currently providing additional funding for their departments of laborers. We should and must do the same. This can't be allowed to happen to our family, friends, or neighbors. We Sir, could you sum up your-, your Yes, I'm summing up. We are currently in a pandemic and we have seen the news in other states like Texas this past week. We must always prepare for the future and for any sort of emergency. I look to all of you to make this a reality. Never let a pandemic or disaster stop us from providing the necessary assistance the citizens of Connecticut expect and deserve. Thank you for your time and consideration. I am willing to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Madam you. Chair. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and um, thank you for coming to testify tonight. Have a good day. Thank you, you. too. Thank you. Uh, Zusali Gonzalez. Followed by her, uh, for, followed by Zusli Kathleen Catherine Fiedler, and then Kathy Flaherty, and then Aaron Kempel. Are they all here? Yes, Suseli Gonzalez. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, she can stay here, but uh, it's gonna uh, speak for her, Sandra Duarte. Uh, she, okay. Who, who, I'm sorry, I need, I need, I need name because we have to put it on the record. So Sandra, can, Sandra Duarte. Sandra Duarte. Could you spell her last name for me, please? D-U-A-R-T-E. Okay. All right. Sandra Duarte. Sí, muy buenas tardes, este, miembros de la Asamblea General. Este, mi nombre es Sandra Duarte. Este, yo vivo en Norwalk, Conérico, de hace 21 años que yo llegué a este país. Y la verdad, he trabajado muy duro, sorry, porque es verdad, yo soy... Entonces, este, yo he trabajado como... Primero trabajé como baby series y luego trabajé como... Estoy trabajando actualmente como este, housekeeping, limpiando casas. Y la verdad, esta pandemia nos ha afectado mucho, especialmente a mí, he perdido muchos customer y verdad, la verdad es este, que yo siento y hay customer que me dicen que mi trabajo es muy importante porque la verdad es que ellos no, no harían el trabajo como, ¿verdad? como uno lo hace, verdad, porque a un sueldo muy bajo, entonces la verdad que es muy importante el trabajo que desempleamos muchas personas y verdad a veces somos también explotadas con el trabajo, Y yo siento que esta pandemia, al, especialmente a mí, me ha afectado porque muchos customers yo he perdido. No, eh, eh, útil, eh, eh, últimamente estoy trabajando tres días a la semana, dos días a la semana. Entonces, la verdad nos ha afectado muchísimo. Y muchas gracias a todos. Yo, yo pues colaboro con las Chapinas Unidas. ¿Verdad? Cuando hay colaboración, yo aporto, colaboro con ellas. Que el Señor les bendiga. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And for, for people that are trying to understand the, the group that is testifying, they are testifying for a line item in the Department of Labor budget to uh, for um, advocacy and coordination of uh, and education of workers' rights. So I've, I've had some people text and ask that, just to let people know. Thank you for your testimony. Catherine Fiedler. Hi, good evening, co-chairs Austin and Walker and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Kat Fiedler and I'm the staff attorney for Save the Sound. I'm here to testify on the deep budget and the need to fund and staff the agency so that it can properly carry out its purpose of protecting all of our natural resources. While many levels of funding in the proposed budget for DEEP have remained similar to recent years, which we commend during this challenging budget biennium, we cannot find much comfort in maintaining the status quo when current funding and staff staffing levels are already low. As Senator Winfield stated during this morning's presentation, this budget annualizes prior rescissions and holdbacks. So the baseline is actually below what the agency might need. And this budget does include cuts as well to the agency. Uh, Senator Winfield posed the fundamental question, what are the impacts of this? And not just with regard to cuts, but to maintaining existing funding levels. DEEP has consistently been asked to do more with less, and this past year has taught us the critical importance of state government functions, including those of our environmental agency. DEEP's charge serves each and every Connecticut resident. The department has shown leadership and perseverance in working to fulfill its mandate through resource constraints. And as Commissioner Dyke stated this morning, the department has been working to get more value out of the resources it has. 
We hugely appreciate these efforts, but that can only get you so far. Save the Sound is particularly concerned with Deep's ongoing ability to conduct environmental enforcement activities, which are critical to ensuring that our strong environmental standards are met. But these activities are resource intensive and require sufficient staffing and cannot be replaced by implementation of technology or other efficiency measures. We seek to understand how the proposed cuts to environmental quality, environmental conservation, and clean air will impact environmental outcomes. I understand that some of these cuts are facilitated by consolidation of infrastructure, but it is unclear from the information I have the extent of what else is impacted. And I hope that this committee can, can learn that information. I'd like to highlight that deep staffing is already around 140 positions below peak levels in 2013. Uh, meanwhile, we've also identified a shift in funding for 12 positions within DEEP from the general fund to the public utility control fund. So I seek to understand if this is just a funding change or if this is a fundamental change in these positions um, and therefore responsibilities that are fulfilled by the agency. And perhaps if this is how the, broad, the new broadband positions are being funded. If the latter is true, is the broadband initiative cutting into the other resource available, resources available for DEEP's core mission? Again, DEEP has done an outstanding job in maintaining and improving environmental quality with significant resource constraints, no doubt in part because of the talented staff. But we do see impacts of resource limitations too. Each legislative session, we see proposals for rollbacks of environmental requirements or of DEEP oversight, again and again, citing the limited resources of the agency. We're seeing declines in on-site inspections that could lead to reduced compliance. And we're seeing privatization of oversight for efficiency's sake. We need to be sure that DEEP can continue to protect the environment and public health, including in light of emerging crises. Thank you for your time on this Friday evening. Thank you, and um, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for coming today and speaking to all of us. Thank you. Um, is Zeus Lee still on? Is Zeus Lee still on? No, okay, all right. Uh, <clears throat> Kathy Flaherty? Good evening, members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Kathy Flaherty. I'm the Executive Director of Connecticut Legal Rights Project. Pleased to be here before you tonight. You have my written testimony, so I actually just want to supplement what I wrote with some additional comments based on what I heard this afternoon. Uh, very glad to hear that the Department of Housing plans to roll out the Emergency Rental Assistance Program on March 1st because it is desperately needed, um, if we, especially if we are going to prevent people from becoming homeless in this state. A um, couple things I'd like you to be aware of is that we at, in legal services don't believe that eligibility should exclude undocumented immigrants. And it's my understanding that the department says that without specific guidance from the federal government, they are going to. Earlier laws did say you couldn't use the money to help folks who are undocumented. This new bill does not put that limitation on. If the state's going to continue to uh, take that position, then we need to put additional state dollars uh, to protect undocumented immigrants who otherwise would become homeless. Anybody becoming homeless during COVID puts all of us in danger. Um, and the sooner people realize that, the better off we will be. Um, so I urge you to do that. Uh, really hope that you will restore the cut to the homeless in housing services line, uh, because the fact that they're trying to have a budget that locks in uh, previous cuts and bases their uh, current use on a year where a lot of things that should have happened didn't because of COVID um, just means you're forcing everybody to do more with less and a lot less. So um, I urge you to restore that cut. Like the investments in supportive housing, urge you to increase them because it's evidence-based, it works. Um, and especially that 150 wraps in 90 days, it's, I'm glad to hear it's not going to lapse and they're actually going to use it because that is what folks need. Um, support the Department of Housing budget uh, to make sure that we can keep people housed in the state. That's, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Kathy, for your testimony and good to see you. Good to see you. Haven't seen you in a little while. It's, it's good to be seen, especially since I've been sick. So I'll see you again. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Have a good have a good evening. Um, Aaron Kempel. Good evening. My name is Aaron Kempel. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Fair Housing Center. We're a statewide nonprofit dedicated to ensuring that all Connecticut residents have access to the housing of their choice. The governor's budget uh, currently level funds the center at $670,000 each year of the biennium. And we wanna thank Governor Lamont 
for keeping us in there and ask that this committee uh, pass the budget with that information in there. The governor, after he revealed his budget, stated that state policy must be guided by the essential core value of making progress towards social and economic justice. By, ensure, by uh, funding the Connecticut Fair Housing Center, the budget and possibly the legislature will be making progress. As you know, the ongoing pandemic has hit people of color particularly hard. People of color tend to work in frontline jobs where consistent hours are scarce and the likelihood of being exposed to the virus is high. In addition, people of color rent their homes at much higher rates than whites, resulting in exposure to other people and COVID-19 in hallways, elevators, laundry rooms, and other common areas. Finally, there is a very wide digital divide that is keeping children of color out of school and people of color out of courtrooms for hearings affecting their housing and the custody of their children, among other legal issues. All of these have and will continue to result in people of, losing, of color losing their homes at very high rates. By funding the Connecticut Fair Housing Center, we will continue our fight to ensure that everyone is able to access the housing of their choice. I also support the Department of Housing and the work that they are doing in rolling out a new emergency rental assistance program. But I would ask again that this committee consider creating a program to serve people who are undocumented because otherwise those tenants and their landlords will be without any assistance. In addition, the current homelessness prevention program does not assist tenants who are facing eviction, but who do not meet the current definition of homeless, which has chronically homeless, which has to do with mental health and addiction issues. It is unclear right now if the new emergency rental assistance program has a way of helping people who don't meet this chronic definition of homelessness. But if they do not, we are asking the legislature to create a program or expand the emergency rental assistance program with funding from the state to help people who are already in summary process, have already had cases filed against them, but are not yet assisted. We helped one such family in, in Hartford today where a mother, her 18 month old uh, child and her eight year old son were about to be put out in the street. But as a result of work through the center and through other agencies such as Department of Housing, we were able to keep that family housed during one of the coldest months of this year. We continue to, we look forward to continuing to work with the state to promote social justice and equity in all of our housing programs. Aaron, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, very good. <laughs> Perfect timing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your advocacy. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Michael Baker. Uh, Michael Barker, thank you so much, Madam Chairman. Thank you so much for the, the gathered legislatures here. Um, I Thank you and good evening. My name is Michael Barker. I am the Managing Director of Westport Country Playhouse. I'm here this evening speaking on behalf of the Connecticut flagship producing theaters, which include Hartford Stage, Goodspeed Musicals, Long Wharf Theater, the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, uh, Westport Country Playhouse, and Yale Repertory Theater. Um, our audiences, as well as our individual staff, uh, artists that we hire and educators come from every town and district in our state. Uh, thank you to everyone in the legislature who supported us in the past. Uh, I'm here today to update you on our continued struggles in the face of the pandemic shutdown of our venues, the successes we've had despite some of these obstacles, and to ask that you consider restoring additional funding to our line item in the budget. Um, my colleagues and I have said, and we have heard you say in rooms talking about the extraordinary funding that came out of DECD last year out of the CARES Act from the federal government, that that was uh, a marked beginning of a new process of supporting the arts in our state and not the end of a process. Uh, the Connecticut flagship producing theaters are nonprofits that in non-pandemic times infused this state with $42 million in economic activity. And you have my written testimony, but just some highlights, 1700 jobs for artists and administrators here in our state, $26 million in taxable payrolls, 388,000 ticket buyers, and beyond that, the mission impact that we have. 
collectively 40,000 students annually. And during the pandemic, we've pivoted to digital delivery of our program. So we are still serving many of those students now. And finally, our organizations have received national recognition that accrues positively to our state, the National Medal for the Arts, 100 national awards, uh, more than 100 national awards, five Tony Awards for Outstanding Regional Theater. And I uh, would emphasize that we are only second to California in having regional theater Tonys in this state. This is an important industry here. The investment that you make in, uh, in us every year consistently results in more than a 400% return on investment. Uh, and so we appreciate and applaud that investment. We hope you will consider uh, restoring additional funding to the line item in this time and support us as we come back and provide entertainment and access to our mission impacts uh, in this state. Thank you so much. Representative Walker, you're muted. Yeah, thank you, Michael Barker. Thank you for your testimony and have a good day. Uh, Shelly Koyala. Shelly Kiala, thank you. Yes, thank you, Representative Walker, and thank you, esteemed members of the Conservation and Development Subcommittee. I'm Shelly Kiala, the Executive Director of the International Festival of Arts and Ideas in New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm here to give testimony in support of funding for arts and cultural institutions in Connecticut. The International Festival of Arts and Ideas has been a strong partner with the state of Connecticut and with the city of New Haven, as well as with many nonprofit and civic organizations and businesses. And we are very grateful for the ongoing support we've received. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on arts and cultural organizations all over the world. And the festival is not an exception to this. The past year has changed a lot for many of us. Now more than ever, it is important to maintain and build connections in our community. It is through these connections that the rich cultural elements of our society can weather the challenging times. The festival is a cultural institution. It's also a driver of cultural tourism. It is a builder of community and it is a proven Connecticut asset that delivers impactful results. In 2019, a little more than two, a little over two years ago, over the course of just 15 days, the festival generated $9.2 million in economic impact. $584,000 in tax sales tax. And on average, 15 million is invested in our state each June as the festival welcomes more than 100,000 attendees to New Haven. In 2020, we changed our model from primarily in person to fully digital. This new model drove engagement with a range of downtown business, uh, restaurants, creating thousands in revenue for them. And in some cases, assisting them in transitioning to a new model during this pandemic. In a non-pandemic year, the festival employs more than 180 people each summer and hosts and facilitates programs that address career exploration and pathway development for youth, artistic expression and workforce development. Since last March, we have both maintained and grown our year round workforce, have doubled down on our commitment to racial equity, and we have increased our investments in neighborhoods in New Haven. We've also deepened our working partnerships with local and regional partners. More than 85% of the festival performances and activities are free to the public. The festival is one of the only institutions of its kind in the world that offers such a breadth and depth of programming with no admission cost. To continue to build on our mission, address important issues, and to provide a platform for this important work, we depend on both public and private funding. The state of Connecticut's support provides critically important foundation that ensures the festival's continued sustainability and access. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you for your testimony. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce Donald, followed by Bruce, Barbara Alexander, then Noah Bloom. I want to remind everybody that you have three minutes for a testimony. So go right into your story. Thank you. Bruce Donald. Thank you. Uh, my thanks to the chairs and members. Uh, I am the Tri-State uh, Coordinator for the East Coast Greenway Alliance. I'm also the legislatively appointed chairman of the Connecticut Greenways Council. And I'm speaking in support of state funding of greenways and parks. The 3000 mile East Coast Greenway became the most visited park in America in 2020 by hitting 50 million bike rides, runs and walks as people flocked to our route as an essential haven of health, sanctuary, and sanity during these difficult times. Working toward the completion of multi-use trail networks in Connecticut over the next few years would help tackle the climate and public health crises by sparking a continued rise in biking and walking 
on safe and equitable public linear spaces. A huge increase in trail usage has occurred from 2019 through 2020 in Connecticut. The Connecticut Trail Census, which is easily found online, reports that usage is up more than 65% across the state, which includes many state park trails, by the way, and, and they're gonna be publishing their complete findings uh, very shortly. I'm specifically supporting the small but crucial Connecticut Recreational Trails and Greenway Grant Program uh, as a line item that's run under the auspices of DEEP. These investments are critically important, uh, you know, apart from the well-documented concerns like health and wellness, economic development, increased property values and tax base, uh, environmental and noise reduction issues, uh, recreational trails are one of the best ways that bond funds can be invested for return on investment uh, in, in any transportation project. Uh, there's a preponderance of uh, academically rigorous studies that prove that point. State money put to work to build and preserve our parks and public open spaces attracts and sustains families and businesses, invigorates communities, and fosters a higher quality of life. We need to protect, enhance, and I would argue publicize more our outdoor recreation opportunities in Connecticut as essential for health and well being, certainly as I discussed, but also as tourism and economic development projects that enhance and enrich our communities. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Have a good evening. Um, Barbara Alexander. Barbara Alexander. Uh, Madam Administrator, is Barbara Alexander in, in the waiting room? She is not Barbara? present, Madam Chair. Barbara? Okay. No, she's not she's not in the waiting room. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Noah Bloom. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for taking the time to hear my testimony. My name is Noah Bloom and I'm the executive director of Neighborhood Music School in New Haven. I'm so grateful to the governor for his proposed budget and to all of you for your consideration in approving this critical funding. Each year, Neighborhood Music School provides unparalleled arts education experiences to 2,500 students from ages six months to 90 plus years from 80. I believe we've lost Noah. Mr. Bloom, can you, you can't hear me because you're, 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 you're probably frozen. I think he's frozen, Tony. Yeah, I, I, you know what, I'm gonna- Go to the next one and then when he comes back in, we can go. We can try him again. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll move on. Um, next, we're gonna have four presenters uh, at one time, David Fay. Frank Tavera, Michael Morin, and Je uh, John Fisher. Good, good evening, good, everyone. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Um, nice to see you all again. I am Frank Tavera, CEO of the Palace Theater in Waterbury. And I'm John Fisher, Executive Director of the Schubert Theater and the Connecticut Association for the Performing Arts Kappa in New Haven. I'm David Fay, the President and CEO of the Bushnell Center for Performing Arts in Hartford, Connecticut. And Michael, you're you're still muted, buddy. <laughs> Go ahead, Michael. I think I'm all set now, correct? You can hear me? Yep. Yes. Good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, member of the committee, members of the committee. We thank you for allowing us some time to share testimony tonight on behalf of the Performing Arts Centers. I'm Michael Moran, President and CEO of Stanford Center for the Arts Palace Theater. We've provided written testimony and welcome any comments or questions you may have regarding that. The four performing arts centers have for years come to testify together as we serve our communities in very similar ways. The four E's. We have addressed the first E, the economic impact in the written testimony. In addition, we all entertain, educate, and enrich the dramatically diverse communities that we serve. We're all reeling from the pandemic 
and have endured the most devastating period in the history of our collective organizations. Equally as important as economics are the social and emotional well being that we offer. A recent letter to the Biden administration on behalf of several mayors stated there is growing evidence and ample data that the arts are proven to be one of the most powerful, resolute, effective, and readily available means for public communication, individual, and collective coping. Our institutions allow people to gather and experience performances that lift our spirits and stimulate our minds. The arts will be an important part of the recovery from this crisis. People need to come together and undoubtedly, we improve the quality of life for both our patrons and our staff. There are countless stories mm -hmm. from the wide-eyed young girl dressed up in character to see a touring Disney theatrical for the first time to the confidence a middle school student gains over the course of six weeks in an arts education program. I'm sure the committee members and my colleagues can all share several heartwarming theater related experiences. We appreciate all the past support, but we need that plus now more than ever. The roadmap to a better tomorrow has performing arts centers all over it. In Connecticut, New mm -hmm. Haven, Stanford and Waterbury are at the core of a better future. You have the written testimony. If you have any questions for us, we're more than happy to answer them. Uh, and, and we've got 30 seconds, colleagues. So if you have something to add, please feel free. We'll yield back to the chairs who are desperate for time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And it's always a pleasure to see you every year. And yes, all of your performing arts are wonderful. So your centers are great. And um, thank you very much for testifying and giving us 30 seconds extra. So thank you. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good thank night. You. Thank you. Did we, did we get back Noah Bloom? No. OK. I am here, if you can hear me. Yes, I can. I I'm can. going to try without the camera. I really apologize, everyone. Okay. We, we saw um, you, so go right ahead with your testimony. So. I appreciate it. So um, I was saying that the pandemic has caused catastrophic damage to our institution. We're facing a $1.5 million loss in earned revenue, and we were forced to reduce our staff by 50%. But despite these challenges, we were able to provide more than 100 hours of one-to-one -one instruction every single day online and run 40 dance classes per week. We also kept our preschool and middle school going and shifted our dance for Parkinson's and other classes for seniors to a virtual platform. For many of our students, maintaining the connection to NMS during the pandemic provided the lifeblood they needed. In the words of one of our high school seniors, when my entire life has been stripped away, if it wasn't for NMS, I simply couldn't get out of bed each day. In the words of a student with Parkinson's, my classes kept me moving, but if it, if not for the connections I have been able to maintain during this time, it was that that was a real life preserver. As our state moves forward through these incredibly challenging times, we must revitalize our economy and strengthen our communities. A thriving arts and culture industry is critical to a strong economy with a profound effects on the tourism and hospitality sector. The funding we receive from the state is also critical to our livelihood. If this funding is lost, our ability to serve the 500 plus students on financial aid will be greatly compromised. And so many of the inequalities that have boiled to the surface over the last year will deepen. During a recent visit to NMS, Senator Chris Murphy reminded us all that the downfall of every great civilization directly correlates with the decrease in funding for the arts. We are all thrilled that Governor Lamont is proposing to keep the great civilization of Connecticut alive by continuing to invest in the arts. Your support of the arts and culture in our state will provide stability now and sustainability for all of us in the future. Thank you for your consideration and we even swear to improve our Wi-Fi should we get the <laughs> funding that we so desperately count on. Thank you, sir. And if you have noticed, they've known that they've got a broadband Bill in here too. So yes, indeed. Thank you, very much. Thank you all for your consideration and all the great work you're doing. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, Lobeth Aguilera. Sí. Yes. Sí. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Lobeth Aguilera. Eh, yo estoy pues aquí presente en esta reunión porque estamos en primer lugar pues y ya que fuimos afectados por lo de la pandemia, 
eh, bueno, yo soy una de ellas, estuve sin trabajar durante más de seis meses, eh, también estamos buscando lo que es eh, los derechos para las trabajadoras domésticas, lo, lo que son hacerles más ver lo que... Eh, más que nada, pues apoyarle por todo lo que ha sido esto, eh, buscarles pues también a muchos los que no, no tienen permiso de trabajo. Eh, ellas a veces son perjudicadas en una atención médicamente, eh, son discriminadas con salarios no justos, a veces hasta menos que el salario mínimo, son despedidas y, y se hace. en todo eso eh, estamos nosotros pues que queremos hacer la lucha por ellas por lo que son las trabajadoras domésticas en esas razones, para que ellas estén mayor informadas, que ellas puedan tener sus derechos, puedan también en los trabajos, pues los laborales, de que ellas puedan ser respetadas, a veces son hasta abusadas en, en horas de trabajo, trabajos extra, eh, pues yo en lo personal conozco mucho que eh, trabajan, trabajan en restaurante y el salario apenas les pagan 6 dólares la hora, no estamos hablando del 50% del mínimo eh, personas que perdieron su trabajo no tienen ni cómo pagar la renta personas que en las clínicas pues no le dan atención médica como es en cuestiones de eso yo en lo personal pues sí fui perjudicada por lo de la pandemia pues todo esto sabemos que sí todo hemos tenido perjuicios de una u otra forma pero en la cuestión de las trabajadoras domésticas, pues yo veo que, que han sido más porque son bastantes que son madres solteras y no han tenido ni acceso a veces a la comida o a la renta, han sido despojadas por no tener cómo pagar la renta. Eh, pues ahí gente estamos buscando que podamos nosotros cooperarles en lo que puedan ser los derechos, hacerles saber cómo protegerse. Lopez, is there anybody that can interpret your your speech for us? Is there anybody that can give us an interpretation of your speech? Yes. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, basically, what uh, you have to give us give me your name, please. Yeah. This is uh, I am Nelly from Connecticut Worker Center, Brasilia Worker Center. And what Lilibet Aguilera was trying to, to say that domestic workers are left behind because especially in the in the pandemic, they, you know, all of them were affected and they need uh, all the government officials to take care of this group of people. Um, we have a lot of families, especially in this time, that um, are affected. Um, they can take their jobs to their houses. They are basically no, with no work today. And some of them are trying to work few hours, few days, but it did change completely to, to our domestic workers. Um, the experience that we, we have today um, it's, it's very sad because uh, most of the families where get sick are with no chance to go to the doctor. They don't have the opportunity to, to have benefits like other workers. So we need the support from all the authorities today and to support our bill of, of um, domestic workers. Um, I, I think um, today we have uh, different organizations that um, are helping domestic workers. And um, I think Lilibet is in Norwalk, I think. So I think it's, it's important um, your, your support. Really, we need your support. Thank you. And thank you for, for testifying. And te thank you. Tell a little bit. Thank you. We appreciate her testimony too. Thank you. Uh, Mary Miko? She is not pr present, Madam Chair. She's not here, okay. Uh, Carmen Lee? Carmen? Go right ahead. Yeah, there you go, go right ahead. 
Ok. Um, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Carmen Lanche. Vivo en la ciudad de Norwal, Conérico. Este, soy la directora de la organización Comunidades Sin Fronteras y estoy aquí para hablar de las trabajadoras domésticas del hogar. Las trabajadoras del cuidado en el hogar son esenciales y han puesto en riesgo a sus familias y a su misma salud durante esta pandemia. A través del país están brindando la posibilidad a sus familias de ser independientes y están esperando con dignidad un pago, recibir un pago digno, justo por su trabajo. Necesitamos aumentar el salario mínimo y reconocer la dignidad y el sacrificio del trabajo del cuidado en el hogar para dar a todas las trabajadoras un pago mínimo de 15 por hora porque se lo merecen y dar un camino a la ciudadanía. El cuidado es esencial. Estamos exigiendo también una inversión a nivel nacional de 450 mil millones para el seguro médico de Medicaid a nivel nacional para crear nuevos trabajos de cuidado en el hogar y asegurar que estos sean buenos, con buenos salarios justos y beneficios. Un aumento en los servicios del cuidado en el hogar para que las personas con discapacidades y los adultos mayores puedan vivir con dignidad en el hogar. Estamos aquí también para que los trabajos de cuidado sean buenos trabajos, con nuestra voz y con nuestra unión. Los salarios tienen que ser justos para mantener a nuestras familias. Más que todo, necesitamos que se que den capacitación también para brindar los más altos estándares de atención. Trabajadoras del cuidado también se unieron fuera de la oficina de Medicaid para exigir estos derechos. Para que, para que el Estado y más que todo eh, a nivel nacional se dé el derecho al Medicaid como parte de un plan de rescate económico que centra a las mujeres negras, latinas, asiáticas e inmigrantes quienes hacen la mayor parte del trabajo de cuidado para nuestros padres envejeciendo y seres queridos con discapacidades. Es necesario que el Departamento de Labor cree fondos para crear talleres educativos, para que así nuestra comunidad también se eduque y no deje robar sus derechos ni sus salarios, como son salario mínimo y horas extras, accidentes y seguridad nacional, eh, industrial, por licencia de la maternidad o del cuidado de un familiar, ausencia por la enfermedad, acoso sexual y discriminación, porque sufren muchas veces en sus trabajos eso acoso sexual y discriminación y también que sepan defender sus derechos cuando las despiden injustamente ustedes como senadores y representantes pueden hacer lo correcto para el futuro de nuestra economía y comunidades es el momento de que pongan atención a todas estas causas porque en esta pandemia todos fuimos afectados gracias thank you um, is Megan Fontaine with you Megan Megan Is Megan there? Megan, um, no. Okay. No, Megan. Um, okay. Well, thank thank you for your testimony. Do you want Do you want to, Nelly? Do you want to translate? You don't need to testify anymore, but do you want to translate? Um, I can give the message to the senators, to the le legislators that um, yes, um, we are asking. Um, your support for domestic workers, um, wage education and enforcement bill. Um, the necessities for our domestic workers in the whole state are, are, are big. So what Carmen is trying to say, um, we are domestic work, we have, dom we have people in our community who come to, uh, to our organizations, are, they are abused. They, they, the employers don't pay. Um, we need to educate domestic workers. We need to collaborate the collaboration with the Department of Labor to reinforce the rights for the workers because we are workers too. And we are the only workers that they don't receive any benefit. So it is very important, very, important for our families because um, we are the worker leaders in our community. And if we can have a good relation, if we can coordinate programs that 
could educate workers, we will be able to help those families. Mm -hmm. I just had somebody yesterday that he worked for 18 years, never ever was had a one week of vacation. So after 18 years, because COVID came, they just ask, do not come anymore. So this worker is asking for help. This guy came to my to my to our office to our organization. So I need I need your support because we are very limited. We are very limited, and I think if we could um, work in collaboration with the Department of Labor to mount a big campaign to educate employers and workers about the laws about the rise, so everyone is well informed and reduce the violation of labor laws and Thank therefore you. workers can receive the fair wage and what they deserve. Thank you, thank you. I, I'm trying to do my best, but- You, I, did, you, did, you did fabulously, you did fabulously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Shim Sneed? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Shaheem Sneed, and I work for the United Way of Coastal Fairfield County, where I manage strategy operations and partnerships for Bridgeport Prospers, um, which is one of four statewide cradle to career collective impact initiatives. Um, we rise today in support of the reinstatement of the $100,000 in the governor's proposed Department of Labor budget. Um, that's House Bill 6439 in support of these four cradle to career efforts. This important funding allows teams of community and resident leaders in Bridgeport, Waterbury, Stanford, and Norwalk to advance strategies that support student and family success, as well as promote economic mobility, especially for our low income and communities of color across the state. The reinstatement of this funding will enable us to build our infrastructure, create a community driven policy agenda and replicate best practices that are poised to redesign systems in health, education, workforce, and economic development. Here in Bridgeport, we've deployed several initiatives focused on expanding access and advancing equity for children and families. We've set out one to tackle the audacious goal that all babies in Bridgeport will be healthy and reach developmental milestones by age three. Our Birth to Three Community Action Team operates an innovative science-informed baby bundle, which is a comprehensive slate of whole family support and practices aimed to reduce maternal and family stress and increase bonding and attachment with their children. Next, we convene a STEM ecosystem, which is a collaborative of local school district, business, and higher education partners working together to expand pipelines to STEM education and careers for Bridgeport youth. And we also have developed a community messengers program focused on holding the power and resilience of advocates, residents, parents, um, to ensure that our local policies and programs reflect the needs of our community. Taken together, we're mobilizing a citywide movement of community leaders driving toward meaningful results and systems change for Bridgeport families. And on a personal note, I was born and raised on the East End of Bridgeport. Um, and my very being here testifying today and my entire career in public service is a re direct result of the kinds of community-based programs and initiatives operated by our statewide collaborative and local partners. Um, the last thing I'll say is there's no shortage of intentional programming happening in Bridgeport and across the entire state, working to center the needs of our diverse community. What we need to do together though, is build the infrastructure to collaborate more effectively and sustainably to scale these efforts. Um, and collective impact and cradle to career strategies, we believe are tools and frameworks to help us get there. And this funding um, that has been reinstated is key to achieving that end. So we're thankful to have legislators like all of you, including members of the Bridgeport delegation who also understand the importance of this funding, especially as we work together to build the COVID-19 recovery that works for everyone across our state. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you so much for your testimony and Representative Santiago, was a strong advocate for cradle to careers. He, you had a good champion in that gentleman. Thank you, thank you. Certainly, Have a thank you so much, you too. Uh, Laura Garcia. She is not present. Okay. Um, Carla Equivil, um, Equivil, Carla? I, think I am here, Carla Esquivel. You're there, okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I am um, work now. Uh, hi, my name is Carla Esquivel. Uh, I live in Stanford, uh, Connecticut. 
Um, buenas noches, ¿cómo están? Mi nombre es Carla Esquivel. Uh, es, vivo en Stanford hace 15 años. Eh, soy un, una madre líder hace 7, 8 años para la comunidad. Eh, empecé mi... Empecé mi, mi entrada a, a esto eh, por medio de mis hijas de la escuela. Me, enfren, me enfrenté a que había mucha discriminación en la escuela. Y cuando yo iba y pedía ayuda, eh, por ser hispana, me negaban cualquier, cualquier ayuda que podían darme. Eh, siempre me decían que tenía que estar agradecida que mis hijas hubiesen nacido acá, en Estados Unidos. Es la manera como la que entro a una organización, me invitan a un grupo de padres en Building One Community, en un centro de inmigración en Stanford, y... Entro allí, eh, soy graduada de PEP, de PLTI, eh, que somos una organización que padres que están fortaleciendo a otros padres. Eh, actualmente empezamos 10 padres y ahora somos 300 padres en este grupo que nos dedicamos a ver el interés sobre la educación de nuestros hijos. Eh, soy invitada por eh, Chapinas Unidas y por Megan. A, a este foro y me encantaría participar sé que es la primera vez que estoy acá pero quisiera uh, poder ver qué puedo hacer la diferencia para poder uh, cambiar o dejar una huella distinta en las empleadas uh, del hogar sabemos que en Stanford eh, más del 100% se dedican a trabajar en eso y más de, más de un 70% quizás es, están en eso. Eh, vemos mucho que las madres no quieren hablar, eh, que son las personas explotadas, mal pagadas, eh, que no llega la ayuda necesaria a ellas. Eh, vemos que no hay, cuando están embarazadas las personas, las corren de los trabajos. Hay mucha discriminación. Eh, tanto para nuestra comunidad hispana, también como la anglosajona. Entonces, uh, yo quiero pedir a los senadores que ellos puedan darnos la oportunidad del apoyo porque necesitamos fortalecer a esas madres, decirles, enseñarles que, que hay derechos y que aquí se pueden cumplir los derechos y llegando a ellas con talleres podemos educarlas. Soy de la opinión que pienso que si educamos una persona, ahora nos educamos nosotros, vamos a, de, a educar a las personas que vienen atrás. Eh, recordemos que no solo están las empleadas del hogar, están las babysitters, eh, están las personas que trabajan en restaurantes y nuestra comunidad ahora necesita mucho apoyo. ¿Por qué? Porque también hemos visto que en esta pandemia es, somos la somos la comunidad que más afectada quizás nos hemos visto. Somos las personas que menos ayudas, menos recursos hemos tenido. Y necesitamos ese apoyo para tener más recursos y poder llegar a más comunidades y poder apoyar y dar esa fuerza laboral que necesitamos. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Nelly, do you want to sum, uh, you want to sum up for, for all of your speakers because Um, we, we do, we're, we're going yes. over. Okay. Yes, uh, we don't, um, Carla was saying that um, we are discriminated as a domestic workers and um, she's part of the Building One community in Stanford and she's in a group of mothers that are encouraging each other to help each other to know their rights and to fight for their rights. So she's asking to the officials the support and the experience that the mothers had are very sad but she still is gonna keep going on working together trying to help each other and yes she's asking to have a protection for domestic workers okay. and i would like to present my because I was before Carla. If I can read my testimony, if it's okay, please. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm gonna read it. Um, my name is Nelly Jara, a Connecticut resident. 
a mother of two children, Sebastian and Cristina, who are attending high school and college. Um, I am from Ecuador, where I was a social worker who helped families in crisis. I am living in this country for 24 years and my first job was a living housekeeping position with a family. Five months after I started working for this couple, I learned that I had cancer. It was very hard for me because my job didn't provide any benefits such as health insurance or, or pay sick time. I was hired through the, an agency to, that they kept my first week of pay and I didn't have a contract or any job security. It was very, I was very lucky to work for such a wonderful family who provide me with a private doctor and care for me, treated me with respect and dignity and pay me fairly. After the job, my next one involved taking care of American children where I ended up staying overnight with them and feeling like I was part of the family. Then I worked for nine years for a couple in which I was a caregiver, a social worker, a therapist, a nurse, a homemaker, a driver, a tailor, and a psychologist. And of course, all was done with a lot of love and respect and care. During the whole time working for 19 years, providing love and care to many families and caring for my own family as well, including my two children. I also found myself having many surgeries, more than 10, in order to fight my cancer. Even though I was blessed with good employers, but I took great care of them and I gave everything with my heart, but I have to say that I never ever have any benefit or, or job security. For several years now, I have been a community organizer in Farfield County, trying to support domestic workers, gaining better employment right to learn self-advocacy and civic engagement. And of course, during this past year, everyone got hit very hard with COVID, including myself and my whole family, <clears throat> where I was hospitalized for a week and I was in intensive care. At the Connecticut Workers Center today, we have provided a great deal of emergency assistance through the pandemic. Workers came and asked to us to help them to get in touch with their past employers since, since they are still owed wages because of the immigration status and the fact that they often don't speak English they often don't feel comfortable going to the Department of Labor. We have tried to support them, but it is very hard. We are here today because it's really important for our community to ensure that the Department of Labor has adequate, adequate resources to support all workers mm -hmm. and to be able to have the capacity to work with communities like ours and organizations like us. We want to be able to refer our community members, members to them for protection under the law. We have all agreed to enact here in our state. If we have laws, shouldn't they be enforced after all? We try to assist workers, support, but we don't have the capacity to do it alone. We truly need the backup and support of the Department of Labor to assist in carrying out this responsibility to all of us in Connecticut. We have to remember that behind every worker, there is a family to be fed, dreams to become true and goals to be accomplished. For people who work in homes across Connecticut providing high quality service and care for families, for children and seniors. We now, especially you, need these protections. Can you set thank some? You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And thank you for staying and in, in interpreting for some of the, the, the other members. Madam uh, Chair, before we go on, mm -hmm. I just want to explain to people that 
links were shared that should not have been shared. And when someone has completed their testimony, they are removed. I have no ability to let them back in. And so for people who are seeking to get back in, in order to provide some assistance, this should have been coordinated with Appropriations Committee staff before the start of the hearing. We are doing the best that we can to get people back in so that they can be of assistance. And I, sorry, Madam Chair, but I felt very strongly I needed to say that. Thank you. And yes, it, it would it would be, be next. It would be better if we had had some translators in with with your with your workers so that everybody could understand the the contents of some of the the testimony. So, if you were able to help, so thank you very much, Nellie. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next, uh, we have Rhonda Caldwell, and then Eric Hammering Hammerling, and Elaine Kolb. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Rhonda Caldwell and good evening, members of the Appropriations Committee. Um, I'm an organizer with Hamden Action Now, an activist group demanding equity in, um, for the Connecticut and black and brown community. Uh, and I wanna thank you so much for allowing us time to speak today in support of an act concerning wage education and enforcement relating to domestic workers. I'm pleased to join the very important coalition to address, to address the desperate needs of the people of color in Connecticut and the domestic workers education enforcement bill, asking the Connecticut Department of Labor to co collaborate with worker organizations to educate domestic workers and employers about minimum wage and overtime rights. For this reason, we need the Connecticut General Assembly to fully fund the staff Department of Labor uh, wage and hour division. Funding the DOL is a matter of life and death in this public health crisis. Um, why do we need funding for the De Department of Labor to enforce the wages, wage laws? Well, because we all know wage theft is a problem. Um, and in a recent study of about 400 domestic workers across New Jersey in, in 2019, more than half of the workers, maybe 57%, had been victims of wage theft. Wage theft occurs when the employer pays less than the minimum wage and fails to pay overtime or fails to pay at all. Employers know exactly what they're doing. The research shows that wage theft gets even worse during an economic recession. Jobs are scarce and workers are afraid to even report violations. The Department of Labor's Wage and Workplace Standards Division needs more funding and staff. Workers are getting sick and dying because their labor rights are unprotected. The Wage and Workplace Standard Division can improve wage enforcement by conducting outreach and education to domestic workers, who, which is absolutely sorely needed. And as on a side note, you know, we are now entering 12 months of the COVID-19 public health um, crisis. Since March, thousands, March of 2020, thousands of Connecticut residents have lost jobs and food and housing is now scarce. The transitional support they have received has been just barely enough to sustain the wage and to sustain the average working family who are now in, in need of dire help. And again, and I always will remind Connecticut residents, the pandemic has caused a sharp rise in homelessness and the domestic workers are there as they are the growing, um, a part of growing tent cities around the state where families are living in the middle of winter during a pandemic. Um, the devastation of this pandemic has also caused residents to lose everything and the black and brown domestic workers have been hit the hardest as they were already living paycheck to paycheck and now since the pandemic has caused them pure economic devastation. With the domestic workers um, also getting sick with COVID and without notice they're being laid off with no sick leave or vacation pay and nowhere to survive while they recover and not even aware of their workers rights. They're already living on reduced hours and now have, their, have the loss of their housing and, and whatever type of benefits they even thought they had. So thank you for this time to speak to you in, on this issue today. And I hope this committee will consider um, supporting this act involving wage education and enforcement, as well as consider finding housing subsidies for the undocumented residents of the state of Connecticut. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you for, for explaining to people because we're trying to figure out where in the budget the this item is and 
it was it you 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 hit it because a lot of people have been texting me asking where is this in the budget so thank you very much for for <laughs> for identifying exactly what you, what the advocacy is for so thank you have thank a good you. thank you uh Rhonda no 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 Eric Hammerling Good evening. My name is Eric Hammerling, and I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. On behalf of CFPA, I'm testifying in support of the governor's proposed budget, in particular, the investments proposed to support outdoor recreation and access to Connecticut's parks, forests, wildlife management areas, and recreational trails. As you heard earlier, recreational trail use on deep properties increased in 2020 by more than 50%. This tremendous increase in usage occurred even though DEEP took actions to limit capacity by reducing parking, limiting group sizes and walk-in visitors, and enforcing capacity closures. Trail use has boomed, and so has attendance at state parks. Thanks to the passport to the parks and <laughs> charged at the gates for Connecticut residents, park attendance grew by approximately 10% in both 2018 and 2019. And we suspect that attendance at state parks grew once again by at least 10% in 2020. Through October, attendance at Hammonasset, Deep's most visited park, had increased by 20%. Parks, forests, wildlife management areas, and trails have been incredibly important to people's mental and physical health during the pandemic. But the increased usage has come with increased operational expenses. The passport to the park has been essential to support increased costs such as PPE to keep frontline park maintainers safe, extra cleaning and trash disposal costs, increased rates for seasonals to keep pace with minimum wage increases, and many other essential but unanticipated costs. According to the budget proposal, expenditures from the passport are expected to exceed revenues generated by the passport fee by over one and a half million dollars in both 2022 and 2023. As operational expenses grow, the ability for the passport to the parks to meet the needs of park operations and maintenance will get more difficult each year. It's critical that the passport remain intact to respond to these needs. One recommendation in our testimony is to move the fringe costs for seasonal and full-time workers out of the passport fund and into the comptroller's budget where the fringe benefits of DEEP's general fund positions are covered. This change would simplify budgeting for the department, reduce salary related expenses in the passport by an estimated 25% and allow the passport to accomplish more for parks and for, for Connecticut. Thank you for the opportunity to testify tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you for testifying and have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, Elaine Kolb and followed by Elaine Kolb, Kevin Dodd. <clears throat> Uh, Ms. Kolb is not present. Okay. Kevin Dodd? Uh, neither is Mr. Dodd. Okay. Um, Eddie Long? Neither is Mr. Long. Okay. Um, David Green? I'm here. <laughs> Go right ahead, sir. Good evening. Um, as the executive director of the Cultural Alliance of Fairfield County, I'm testifying on behalf of the proposal in the governor's budget <clears throat> to replenish the tourism fund devastated during the pandemic to a pre-pandemic level with resources from the general fund. The Cultural Alliance is a membership alliance of over 550 nonprofit, for-profit and individual artist members across coastal Fairfield County from Greenwich to Shelton. We provide marketing, professional development and advocacy services connecting members to one another and to their publics, weaving together our economic and cultural infrastructure. During the pandemic, we've had even greater contact with our members with weekly Zoom community conversations to members to share their concerns. These have included the bridge loans, the PPPs, the shared work program, pandemic unemployment insurance for gig workers, virtual fundraising, crisis financial planning, virtual programming, reopening requirements, and the threat of permanent closures. These and other issues have been thrashed out, information shared, and recommendations made. In addition, since last March, we have conducted three 
countywide surveys to measure the loss itself. <coughs> We study and promote the interconnectedness of our arts and culture ecosystem with the economic landscape of our region. As you know, arts and culture is an industry with a very high return on investment. At least $3, some report as many as $7 return for every dollar invested. Our 2016 report on the arts and economic prosperity of Fairfield County showed that in our region, nonprofit arts and culture organizations and their audiences spent at least $235 million, generating $20 million in state and local government revenue and supporting at least 6,700 FTE jobs in 2015. This activity and impact, as you know, has taken a devastating pounding with the pandemic. Statewide, the sector has lost $2.5 billion in sales, over 33,000 jobs and $400 million in revenue. We are all very grateful that the governor and DECD commissioner recognize the value of our industry and the degree to which it has suffered during the pandemic by having awarded $10.5 million of emergency federal CARES Act funding to the Office of the Arts and Connecticut Humanities, both of which fund us. But this is just the beginning of recovery. The sector, the, this industry needs greater investment. It needs both further emergency relief funding to enable it to recover and contribute to the recovery of the state, plus increased and sustained investment in the future to enable it to flourish and sustain its contribution to a vibrant Connecticut. We ask for further recognition of the critical role our arts and culture industry plays in the recovery and rebuilding of our state not only in its economic recovery, but also in the recovery and restoration of the emotional and mental health of our citizens. The Tourism Fund is Connecticut's chief investment mechanism for the arts, culture, and tourism. Mr. Green, could you sum up, please? It's been devastated during the pandemic and projected to not rebound until FY23. We ask you please to support the governor's proposal to restore $12.9 million to the fund to maintain the health and security of our industry. We also ask that in order to stabilize arts, culture and tourism funding, you increase <coughs> diversify the financing of the tourism fund through proceeds from other state taxes or new revenue streams. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you and thank you for your testimony. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Elaine Kolb. Yes, I'm Elaine Kolb. I live in West Haven, Connecticut. I am here representing the people that are dying in large numbers, people that are living in institutions, people that are elderly, people that are disabled, people that are low income, people that are undocumented. We are dying in huge numbers right now. Everybody knows this. But we were dying in huge numbers to begin with anyway. I am a member of Mothers and Others for Justice. And what was a critical, desperate situation for millions of our people all over this country has now been brought to the forefront. Will it be really, really addressed this year? Will it? How many more will die? There is a bill Senate Bill 194, establishing a right to housing. How many of you know what it's like to live in an institution? I do. I lived on the grounds of a mental hospital for a year because there was no accessible housing or transportation available to me. Right now, if you don't provide the kinds of services that make it possible for people to live in dignity in the community with the assistance that they require. That means personal assistance. So yes, domestic workers include people that assist people with disabilities and elders in their own homes to live in freedom. Do you know what it's like to lose your freedom? Anybody that lives in an institution, whether they are in a prison or a hospital or a mental hospital or a nursing home or a group home, all 
Those people are homeless people. They do not have their own home. They do not have the key. They cannot come and go as they wish. That's not freedom. We have an opportunity to do something that is really, really positive and powerful. But as you plan on how to do this, and I pray it will happen, please make sure that you don't forget not to cut the things that make it possible for live, people to live and survive in the community. Right now, there are thousands of people right here in the state of Connecticut who are desperate and don't want to get caught because they are in horrible situations. They don't have food. They can't pay for what they, what they need. And they don't want to get caught because we don't want to be put away in institutions where we really, really will die. We'll take a chance at suffering in the community. Please, with your budget cuts, don't cut the things that make it possible for us to survive. Please don't do that. Please support the things that will support real freedom in the community for everyone, including the most vulnerable and the homeless. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you for coming up and being an advocate up here, uh, uh, well, in Hartford for people who are somewhat voiceless. So thank you very much. And thank you for your testimony. Have I a good was there one of the last days that you had any kind of hearings back in March. Oh, yeah. I was there. And now I'm here again. Bless you each and all for thank what you. you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Madam Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm just curious. I I did not catch the Senate bill that the last speaker testified on. And what I'm curious about is whether these are bills that were not taken up by the committees of cognizance and people are feeling that they need to come to the appropriations committee to be heard. Um, if that is the case, I just think we should try and figure that all out. Thank you, sir. Once again, I just, I, I don't know what the, the Senate bill was. Uh, it was Sen that. Senate Bill 194. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Heba Abab, Abab, Abbas. Heba Abbas. Uh, Suzanne Amon Amonville. Amonville, yes, hi. hi. Good evening. This is regarding HB 06439. My name is Suzanne Damonville, a longtime supporter of Music Haven, an exceptional tuition free music education and mentoring program for underserved kids in the New Haven area. I'm urging you to put Music Haven back into your budget. A year ago, the program rallied to have their, to, to save their state funding and were told that they had won. Despite this promise, Music Haven was not included in the budget for this year or future years. The legislators who responded to Music Haven's inquiry stated that, quote, it was a mistake. The same response they received last year. The program that Music Haven provides has been life-changing and life-saving for these kids. It has been proven that music has a positive impact on children's educational development, specifically around science and math skills. So far, the program has had 100% matriculation rate to four-year colleges. I'm asking you to please make good on your promise. Thanks so much. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. Mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, uh, Representative gosh. Walker, um, uh, back to uh, Senator Miner's um, uh, conversation. Right now, we're hearing testimony on the on the bills that are the the budget that's in front of us in conservation and development. Is that um, and these bills are how are the bills relevant to um, what we're talking about? I just want I I I I think I missed a component. And I'm just curious, uh, 
were they sent here because they think that the item that they want to talk about yeah. is in the budget and relevant to the um, uh, to the particular budget that we're talking about tonight? I'm just curious. I'm they're just asking, trying to... they're ask, uh, Elaine Kolb is um, asking for support for a housing bill for Senate Bill 194. And I believe that costs, that's money. I don't know the details of it, but that was the request that she had in her testimony. Okay. And the domestic workers that are here, they're here asking for a line item to be put into the Department of Labor. Okay. So they are all- So there isn't a current line item. So when I'm looking in the budget, there's it, nothing there right now. It is not, but they are asking- Okay, I get it. That's why I want, I just want to make sure that when I'm looking at this and going back, because I'm going to read over a lot of this stuff this weekend right. that I'm not missing a component of it. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, thank I, you. I, I appreciate the explanation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, uh, Josh Powlick. <laughs> Powlick. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, please pronounce your last name for me so I don't butcher it. <laughs> it's Pollock, like a dog licks its Pollock. paw. Okay, Pollock. thank you. Uh, and I'm Reverend Josh Pollock. I'm the minister at the Unitarian Universalist Society East in Manchester. I'm a leader with the Recovery for All campaign. And I'm here tonight as a longtime participant in the Connecticut, the uh, Connecticut's Domestic Worker Justice Campaign. I'm a resident of Glastonbury. I come before you this evening in support of this idea to add a line item to the Department of Labor uh, budget so that they can enforce uh, the, the rules that would prevent wage theft and then educate domestic workers and their employers about domestic worker rights. My concern, which matches the concern of others who are testifying this evening, is that wage theft is far too common an experience among our state's domestic workers. I've met many domestic workers and personal care attendants over the last decade, and the vast majority report experiencing wage theft at some point in their work history. Domestic workers already have minimal rights in the workplace due to historic exemptions from federal and state labor statutes. They're already a highly vulnerable workforce made up mostly of women of color, a large number of whom are immigrants, some of them undocumented. They are easily exploited, easily marginalized, easily ignored, yet they are essential workers. They take care of the elderly. They take care of people with disabilities. They take care of children. They clean, they cook, they run errands. They help with personal hygiene. They sometimes help with clients' medical regimens. They offer critical companionship. Their services enable their clients' family members to work and earn an income. They are the workers who make all other work possible. So wage theft occurs when an employer pays less than the minimum wage, fails to pay overtime, or fails to pay at all. Research shows that wage theft increases during difficult economic times. The Department of Labor can improve wage enforcement by conducting outreach and education to domestic workers and by collaborating with community organizations who have strong connections to domestic workers, but it needs sufficient funding and staff to do so. So please consider this request as you respond to the governor's budget proposal. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And thank you for clarifying again for people so that they understand. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Amar al Haider, Not here. Not here, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Gregory Tompkins. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Thank you, everyone, for hearing me this evening. Uh, my name is Gregory Tompkins, and I'm testifying today in support of the committee following through on restoring Music Haven's funding in the governor's budget. And to that end, I'd like to read a statement from one of my students who could not be at the meeting this evening. I'm a teacher at Music Haven. Mm -hmm. Rain Bowman has been a student at Music Haven since 2013. She's now 17 years old and a junior in high school in, in New Haven in the public schools. She writes, Music Haven has worked very hard to keep the program free to all their students. Last year, Music Haven was close to losing $100,000 in state funding due to the budget cuts. Music Haven worked hard to get the money back. We called, we wrote letters, and we even drove up to Hartford to save our funding. After going to Hartford and waiting for nearly four hours, Music Haven finally got the good news that the legislators were able to make sure that we got our funding back. 
Despite this, it was never put back into the budget. This means we're getting zero dollars from now on. The legislator who has gotten in contact with Music Haven claims that the zero dollars in funding was a mistake. I am asking as one of the Music Haven students that you please fix the mistake and not forget about us because Music Haven means so much to me. Without Music Haven, I would have no way to express myself as I am able to express myself with my violin. Please consider fixing the mistake and providing the funding back to Music Haven. Again, that is, that is from uh, Rain Bowman, one of my students who's a, a high schooler in New Haven Public Schools. And, and on another note, I'd just like to add my support to adding a line item, uh, supporting domestic workers that we've heard from so many folks about this evening. Many of the families of my students at Music Haven rely on wages from domestic work uh, and this money would be important in normal times, but to support them with this money in our current world, it's not really possible to overstate how essential it is. And I just wanna quote uh, Reverend Pollock we heard from just a minute ago uh, and say that domestic workers are the workers that make all other work possible. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you and thank you for your testimony. Uh, Patrick Mahone. Good evening, distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. I'm Patrick McMahon. I'm the CEO of the Connecticut Main Street Center. We are the state's leading downtown resource center, and we've been serving the state uh, for over the last uh, 25 years. Uh, we are also act as the state coordinating program for the National Main Street Center, a, nation, a nationwide Main Street network. We work with communities all across the state uh, to revitalize their downtowns as well as their neighborhood commercial districts. Uh, we currently serve over 80 member communities, large and small, from village centers like Coventry to urban downtowns like Bridgeport. Our partners include local nonprofit Main Street programs, downtown special services districts, municipal CEOs, and their uh, planning and economic development staff. We would like to work with more communities. However, we need additional staff capacity. We are respectfully requesting that the legislature allocate Connecticut Main Street Center an annual line item appropriation of $350,000 administered via uh, the Department of Economic and Community Development. We were started by CLMP, now Eversource in 1995. In addition to Eversource Energy, the Department of Economic and Community Development is one of our founding sponsors and we've been proudly working alongside their staff over the last two decades. This current fiscal year, DCD is funding us at $150,000 through a Manufacturer's Assistance Act grant, but that amount will not sustain us long-term or help us grow to assist more communities. We have a track record of success that is spelled out in our written testimony. We provide high quality educational programming and networking opportunities for a wide range of stakeholders involved in downtown revitalization. We have provided economic and recovery strategies like the one completed for Sandy Hook Village after the Newtown tragedy. And we've been working very closely with DCD and small business support programs to help our communities during the current COVID crisis. The COVID crisis is majorly impacting our downtowns as you've heard, uh, over 600 uh, restaurants have closed many in downtowns, and there's reports that a third of small businesses have closed, again, many in our downtown areas. With additional funding, we can ensure continuation of our current uh, three and a half staff members and hire a field services specialist. Uh, this position would coordinate and provide technical services to improve revitalization outcomes for communities. Uh, the specialists would uh, provide reconnaissance visits and community assessments, downtown strategic plans, convening and consensus building facilitation, and advising on a wide range of topics, including zoning, financing, adaptive reuse of historic buildings, tax increment financing, COVID recovery, and more. With additional funding, we can increase our impact and work to meet uh, many of the state's objectives, including in the areas of opportunity zones, transit-oriented development, complete streets, affordable housing, historic preservation, cultural districts, and small business assistance. Our downtowns and main streets are economic drivers and job centers for the state and are important for the state's quality of life. We ask that you support our request and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for coming and staying with us tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Dr. Natalia Tracy. Dr. David. Good evening, honorable members of the appropriation committees. I'm here to speak in support of an acting concerning wage education and enforcement relating to domestic workers. I speak as the executive director of the Brazilian Workers Center in Massachusetts and co-director of the Connecticut Workers Center in Bridgeport. And I'm also a professor of labor studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. I have been working in Connecticut since 2012 as an organizing labor laws, legislative work campaigns, and as an immigrant rights worker. I'm also uh, worked as a domestic worker for 15 years. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight, to advocate for resources for the State Department of Labor and for community partners to enforce the labor laws that have been uh, thoughtfully and recently put on the books in Connecticut. Domestic workers have been historically invisible group of workers often working in private and out of view of spaces and the industry of our society has a long history of uh, not recognized as real work. Sadly, excluded from National Labor Relations Act and Fair Labor Standards of 1930s. We are still working to correct that unfortunate and unjust omission today. The hard to reach nature of these workers, most often women of color, immigrants, low income, many speaking other languages, often um, heard of um, housework and single mothers, require responsive community organization like ours to spend concerted energy to collaborate with the state labor authorities to organize, educate, advocate, and work with women of color to support the assertion of their rights to respect dignity and fair pay as workers. According to the US Census 2010, Connecticut is home to a complex group of over 40,000 domestic workers. Some in union, some paid through public funds, but many are private employed. Despite these guarantees, many still experience underpayment of wages for their duties. That is wage theft. Because of the lack of regulations, enforcement of public understanding of Connecticut good laws against wage theft, even though it has been estimated that Connecticut low wage workers suffer annually $6.5 million in stolen wages, enforcement of our law needs to be taken place. But we need to do our part. I ask you for support because we do need to pass an act of education, a net concerning wage education and enforcement relating to domestic workers that will give both Connecticut DOL and community partners the resources to work in collaboration to provide education and fair enforcement of our current state laws. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you for, for giving us the, uh, the name of the, the way you'd like the, the wage. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> um, uh, next, we have Elsie Chapman. Good evening, Honorable. Hmm. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, let's see, we have... Oh. Let's see. Oh. People have microphones open, please close them. Thank you. Thank you. Go right ahead, try. Good evening, honorable members of the Appropriations Committee. Someone has on their Zoom and they also have on YouTube. They just have to turn one off. Yeah, yeah. they have it on both. They have two, two electronic means up at once. Thank you. Yep. If you have, if you have, if you have, uh, Ms. Chapman, if you have Facebook Live or any of that open or YouTube Live, it will give us feedback. So everybody that might have both of them, please turn them turn one off. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. Everybody, no. Everybody, everybody choose one. I'll tell you what, let me try this. Okay, is that better? Yes. Go right ahead, Ms. Chapman. Is that better? Yes. Okay, I turned off my telephone and turned on my computer. Okay. Uh, good evening, honorable members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak this evening. I'm Elsie Chapman, a New Havener and vice chair of the board of the International Festival of Arts and Ideas. And I'm here to give testimony in support of funding for arts and culture in Connecticut. The COVID-19 pandemic has been devastating to Connecticut's art and culture sector, a sector that we know is critical to Connecticut's economy, vitality, and quality of life. That said, the festival adds its support to current proposals to grow, and strengthen the arts and culture community beyond this pandemic. We need to ensure that this critical sector will not only survive in Connecticut, but thrive. When COVID hit, festivals one by one around the world canceled their season. From Spoleto in South Carolina to Jazz Fest in New Orleans to the Edinburgh Festival in Scotland, all canceled. The International Festival of Arts and Ideas decided to take a different path. When other festivals said they couldn't, we decided to become the festival that could. We decided that this festival would be very different from any done before, but it would still be a festival everyone would love. When the festival concluded, we had welcomed 120,000 virtual guests from the US and 27 countries around the world. We had self-guided walking tours and self-guided bike tours. We continued our community outreach, working with two New Haven neighborhood communities to present our long-standing neighborhood festivals, all virtual. We celebrated the 10th graduation of our six month long high school festival fellowship program, taught in partnership with Gateway Community College. All 16 festival fellows graduated receiving four college credits. Yes, even those classes pivoted to virtual learning. More than 85% of festival programming is free. In 2020, it was all free, except for our food series, which brought New Haven chefs into participants' homes via Zoom, and Arts on Call, where New Haveners enjoyed live, socially distanced outdoor performances by local performing artists. The $35,000 raised for the food series and the $10,000 raised for artists on call went directly to the restaurants and the artists. The festival put on nearly 200 events and 265 performances in 2020. Our audiences were overjoyed with what we were able to accomplish. On behalf of the festival, I want to thank you for 26 years of support and commitment to our partnership. A partnership that has certainly benefited the state economically and culturally, and has brought to the state national and international recognition. Thank you for your continued financial support and investment in what we do. We all know it's an investment with exponential returns. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ms. Chapman, for that testimony. And thank you for coming, spending time with us tonight. Thank you, and your advocacy. Um, next, we have Michael Passero and Curtis Goodwin together. Are they here? Yes, we are both here, Madam Chair. Hey, um, I will kick it off. Uh, my name is Michael Passero. I am the mayor of the city of New London. And I'm honored uh, to be joined by one of the city councilors of New London, Curtis Goodwin. So uh, Representative Walker, Senator Osten, members of the Appropriation Committee, thank you so much for this opportunity. We are going to testify tonight in support of increased funding for the performing arts, the six performing arts centers in the 
state of Connecticut. New London hosts one of them, which is Guard Arts. Mm -hmm. I have submitted written testimony. I'm not going to repeat that. I'm going to speak briefly um, uh, in the interest of time. Um, so let me thank you all, first of all, for the time you put into this and the work that you do for us. Guard Arts is the heart of the city of New London. New London is known for its arts and culture, and it serves as the convening space for not only the city, but for the region. It also drives our local economy. Guard Arts is, has shows and has opened nearly 80 to 85% of the nights throughout the year, whether it's the winter cinema series, which as movie theaters are failing, Guard Arts can fill the 1400 seats in its house for its winter cinema series. The Eastern Connecticut Symphony Orchestra is hosted at Guard Arts. You can go there and see shows like Melissa Esridge or David Crosby. It has become just a driving force in Eastern Connecticut and in downtown London. I just can't even begin to tell you how much, if there's been losses for our community for this pandemic, many, many people would tell you that the greatest loss is being able to meet and to be able to um, enjoy the great uh, shows that the guard puts on and just to mingle with each other and meet each other. So what we're asking is modest. We're asking that the funding that's earmarked uh, in the current budget for guard arts at $155,961 we're asking that that be increased to $300,000. I think it's a modest ask considering the situation we're in. The Guard was the leading um, force in our community and we work, we're working so hard to save all of our businesses and keep as much of our lives going. The Guard cannot open and has not opened since mid-March uh, nearly a year ago. And it will be one of the last uh, institutions in our city to reopen. We need to keep it there. We need to have that when we get back to normal. With that, I wanna introduce a young man we're very proud of. He has a connection with Guard Arts because 10 years ago, he started a movement in this city with the Youth Talent Show and with Representative Nolan, by the way, as one of his partners in that. He has um, influenced the lives of hundreds and hundreds of young people with this one show. He's in, uh, in just an impressive young man. He has been elected to his first term on the city council. And with that, Madam Chair, I will yield the floor to city councilor Curtis Goodwin. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Pastoral. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Chair. My name is Curtis Goodwin. As Mayor Pastoral just in, uh, said, I am a city councilor here at the city of New London where I chair economic development for the subcommittee. And if you could bear with me for just two minutes. I give you my title politically to simply state that I have a grasp for what it feels like to be in your predicament where you must make tough budget decisions. However, each and every day we must show up with integrity and we must make decisions that are in the best interest of the people in which we are so privileged to serve. Unfortunately, budget seems to imply that art and equity is too expensive. If we use me as a quick example, I'm a city councilor, a minority business owner, a father, a mentor, and the decisions of policymakers and leaders failed me growing up. So much so that I almost lost my life to a system that simply stifled me. Yet here I am, a part of the solution. Art changed my trajectory. I created a showcase 11 years ago as a response to a brutal murder of a young artist in our community. Six black teens murdered this artist. The papers nationwide painted our black and brown teens as bored thugs. Such a broad brush, I know, but something I knew only art could combat. The talent show brings in over 65 cities to sold out shows at the Guard Art Center yearly. We bring unimaginable worlds together. Autistic rappers, country singers, amazing trans dancers, all fed, safe, guided, and empowered all performing together in front of a blended audience of mayors, friends, family members, teachers, police, community. It's community like you've never seen it before. Our alumni are college graduates, 
12 of them have launched their own businesses in Southeastern Connecticut. Two are doctors, three professional dancers for the MBA, real estate agents, politicians, and the success stories can go on. During this pandemic, it is critical that my outreach continues. The government has failed our most at-risk youth with the handling of this pandemic. It's disproportionate, we can all agree there. The lack of immediate resources, unemployment, and unfortunately, I'm seeing the devastating impacts daily, socially and mentally on our youth as they watch deaths happen all around them. Our kids are truly suffering. To sum up, we need to re-engage them so that they are better students, better workers, better kids, and better citizens. I find myself wondering, at what point do we return to the fundamentals where we trust the data that shows that arts provides meaningful and vital interactions, connections across boundaries, cultural competency, bridges into our diverse community, social and economic benefits, shelter and safe he heavens, and so much more. Let's reimagine communities that work for us, where art plays an integral role. I am that example of what arts can do and the thousands of youth are also. I am simply challenging each and every one of you to be aggressive with arts-based funding commitments and help us continue to save lives. The Guard Art Center saved mine. Thank you for your time and consideration, Madam Chair, and all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Curtis, for, for this testimony. Thank you for, for being a strong advocate, both for arts and for our children in our communities. And um, thank you very much for, for, for staying and, and testifying. Have a good Thank you for the time. Thank you. Um, Raven Levo Mulan, Mutan. Mulan, that's okay. Um, I, I had my hand up. I just wanted to say something to Curtis. Oh. Oh. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Um, I just wanted to thank Curtis for uh, his passionate um, advocacy, uh, you know, advocacy for the arts um, and his uh, example and mentorship within his community. I thought he did a great job and, uh, and his community should be very proud of him. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Raven? Uh, Ra Ra Raven? Raven. Raven. Hi, Raven. Go right ahead. Hey, I also want to like celebrate everybody today because you guys are all fighting for stuff I'm completely for. Not that this relates to what I'm about to say, but like I'm just letting you guys know that I appreciate it because you guys are fighting the good fight. Anywho, my name is Raven, a public ally from the state of Connecticut, a certified sexual assault crisis counselor through the YWCA in New Britain and victim advocate for trans women of color. I'm one of many advocates focused on the elderly, immigrants, people who are differently abled, Muslim women, and Caribbean and West Indian women, along with other com with our community advocates who focus on the needs of men, women, children, and whoever don't fit in those highly victimized communities. I'm speaking on behalf of men, women, and children, families, and immigrants, and other nonprofit organizations I am not directly a part of. Every hat I wear has been directly impacted by the coronavirus. Shelters are seeing a humongous increase in Connecticut citizens in need of emergency housing, all of which have been directly impacted by the coronavirus. People are being forced to take on roommates due to unpredictable income variants, such as coronavirus outbreaks and aren't making enough overall to afford housing. Service providers are being overworked. Our community resources are struggling to meet grant requirements to service our communities. People are afraid for themselves and their families contracting the virus. Unemployment benefits have stopped and bills are stacked piling and light, bill, light bills are going up through the roof, furthering the debt carried over from when the state was shut down. People are losing their housing because of their inability to pay and landlords are not being understanding. With that being said, domestic violence rates has also gone up. So I say that all to say This is important, fighting for everyone's needs, including the arts. I know that wasn't directly in what I said, but it's all important because even with the youth, they don't have that 
sense of community, that sense of being able to have outlets. So yeah, that's all I had to say. Thank you, Raven. Can you just tell me, what are you, what, what are you here testifying for? I know, I know your, your passion, but what, what specifically, we're here for the budget. So what specifically in the budget are you here to testify for? Um, I forget the bell, but it's the one where we're putting money towards community organizations. For domestic workers? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your thank you for your testimony. Uh, <clears throat> uh, next, Stephen Cohn. Good evening, Representative Walker, Senator Austin, member of the members of the uh, committee. Steve Cohen from Mystic Aquarium. Appreciate the opportunity to testify tonight. I am testifying in collaboration with the Maritime Aquarium at Norwalk. We work very closely together. And um, on behalf of both institutions, we want to express our sincere appreciation to the committee, the General Assembly, the governor, uh, and the state for the financial support that we've received over the years. Uh, it has been absolutely vital to our organizations and the communities we serve. Uh, the impact of COVID-19 uh, has been very harsh on uh, both institutions. Uh, we have to keep our, our, our facilities operating uh, to assure that animals are properly cared for. And so the expenses are largely fixed even as uh, revenues have diminished from uh, reduced admissions, capac admissions capacity under COVID-19. Operating deficits for both institutions total $20 million at this point. We appreciate that both institutions are line items in this year's budget. And we respectfully request a consideration of a modest increase from the roughly 315,000 to 500,000 for each institution. Our request is based on the fact that first of all, uh, annual funding for both institutions was historically higher than what we are requesting but has been consistently reduced over a 10 year period through a series of budget rescissions. And secondly, uh, we've re resisted asking for increased funding in previous years, but the pandemic uh, has really posed a critical moment when both institutions need additional financial support. Uh, as we've said many times before, we view, and I hope you view, uh, assistance for both institutions as an investment in Connecticut's economy. Um, as the state works to reopen and restore economic activity, both aquariums are critical to jumpstarting the tourism economy. Um, the aquariums are anchors for restaurants, hotels, retail shops. Uh, in Before the pandemic, uh, visitor uh, count was 1.3 million visitors a year uh, for both institutions. 60% of visitation at Mystic Aquarium is coming from out of state. And more than uh, also prior to uh, COVID-19, 1,700 jobs were directly attributed and dependent upon both institutions. We would like assistance to be part of the solution in bringing the tourism economy back for Connecticut. We need help at this time. And we appreciate all of the support that we have had over the years and your consideration of this, uh, of this request. Thank you, sir. And thank you for your testimony. Um, I, I assume that the, your, your, who you mentioned will be testifying also later on. Tonight. Yes. Okay, good. I just, I just want to make sure. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ha have a good evening. Thank you. Robert Robert LaFrance. Good evening, uh, Representative Walker and Senator Austin, uh, chairs of the committee, as well as ranking members Minor in France and Vice Chairs Hartley, uh, Ethan, and Nolan. My name is Robert LaFrance, and I am the Director of Policy for Audubon Connecticut. We're an arm of the National Audubon Society. And I want to thank uh, everyone here this evening for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. I'm here to uh, talk a little bit about 
Governor's Bill 6439. Um, more specifically, and I was listening to the discussion this morning with the commissioner and the members of the committee to talk in some detail about the governor's budget for the, for the department. Um, as folks who know me know, I was the liaison for a number of years for the department, and I uh, am here. I was also counsel for the Environmental Conservation Branch, and I'm here to advocate strongly for additional funding for the Environmental Conservation Branch. They do really critical work that I think is super important that this committee take cognizance of and make certain that it's properly funded. I think folks are aware, but I want to reemphasize that with climate change coming forward, we need to make certain that our scientists, foresters, and other folks who work within the department make certain that we have the best available science so we can understand these challenges as we move forward. Uh, I wanna associate my remarks with that of Eric Hammerling who earlier spoke about the need to keep the passport to parks intact. Uh, it's really important that that happen because that's the place that I know we at Audubon during the pandemic have realized many, many new people have come into the bird watching community. They've come into the bird watching community because it was a way, a respite from the tremendous pressures that have happened as a result of COVID-19 and the ability to reconnect with nature is something that's significant and important. Um, the last thing I wanna make certain that folks are aware of is our, our real interest in making certain that the environmental conservation police officers, that force, uh, is fully funded and is available to deal with not only taking care of the parks, which I think they do a fantastic job of, but also make certain that they enforce and are able to enforce the variety of uh, natural resource laws that we have, hunting, fishing, uh, bird protection. We uh, run uh, piping plover and we want a uh, piping plover uh, nesting areas and we, we need the NCON police officers to be able to help us in, ensure that those nesting birds are protected. Uh, in closing, I'll just mention that as a National Audubon Society, we're also trying to fund um, work of the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection through federal funds. And we're continuing to work in DC to try and get something passed called the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Our hope is that if we get that passed and can move some money from the federal government to the states, uh, we'd like to see that happen. And our hope is that we can leverage that. And in my written comments, you'll see more about that. And I'm happy to discuss it. So I thought you asked great questions of the department this morning. Uh, and uh, I will do anything I can to help make certain that the Environmental Conservation Branch gets fully funded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you for your testimony tonight. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Stephen Siegel and Rufus Duram. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rufus Duram. Um, I'm the executive director of the Warner Theater in Torrington, Connecticut. Um, I won't go too deep into my written testimony, but I do echo what my arts colleagues around the state have said here tonight. Um, we are in dire straits. Um, the Warner Theater uh, is an economic driver, not only for Torrington, but we serve the broader, mostly rural Northwest Connecticut. Um, we give about $8.1 million of economic impact to the region and support 121 full-time jobs. And we bring in between 80 and 100,000 people a year uh, to our businesses, hotels, um, restaurants, all that. And then a region that only has 187,000 people, that's quite an impact. Um, I, I uh, here with my colleague, uh, Steve Siegel, we've been working together cooperatively uh, along with the other major performing arts centers, um, seeking funding uh, support, um, but uh, it, it's, it's not been easy. My job here actually started on March 30th. So I, one of my first acts as an executive director was having to move all of my uh, employees from furlough to layoff. We typically have about 12 full-time employees, 78 uh, part-time employees and 10 contract employees around, and around 800 volunteers uh, per year. And we are down to three full-time employees and six part-time employees. Um, downtown Torrington uh, cannot recover without the Warner. Um, and we are a central pillar for the Northwest Connecticut uh, economic, comprehensive economic development uh, plan. Um, so we are asking for consideration. Uh, we thank you for your support, um, but we are asking uh, to be brought up to uh, funding to match our sister organizations across the state um, and be part of the solution of getting people back down onto Main Street, 
back into the northwest corner um, and back into our great state of Connecticut. Steve. Thank you. I'm Steve Siegel, the executive director of the Guard, uh, resident of New London. I, I've been at the Guard for 33 years. I like to uh, uh, say hi to uh, Senator Austin and Representative Walker and uh, all you friends, those I know and those I don't on the Appropriations Committee. I want to especially thank you because this is the first time uh, since March 13th of last year that I've had the opportunity and reason to wear a tie. So this is a momentous uh, moment for me. So I want to thank you for that. But I also want to thank you for your decades of support for the arts. You have been unflinching in your support of specific institutions and the arts in general. And I want to just briefly sum up by saying that I want you to consider performing arts centers as the urban based engines that will really reignite not only the economic quality of life, but really put together a state and, and, and a country that has been so divided along lines of race, uh, geography, and just pure isolation. I think your performing arts centers will be your partners in making sure that whatever you appropriate, it will have the kind of dynamic effect. So it will create what you see behind me, uh, a crowd where uh, social distance is trying to be uh, uh, avoided, uh, not followed. So again, thank you all so much for what you do and uh, hope to see all of you soon in person. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Rufus. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you for your advocacy. Uh, Julia Wilcox. Yes, thank you. Um, good evening, Sen Good evening. I'm Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, and Representative France, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you so much for being here and for the opportunity to testify this evening. Uh, my name is Julia Wilcox, um, and I'm the Manager of Advocacy and Public Policy for the Connecticut Community Nonprofit Alliance. The Alliance is the statewide advocacy organization representing the nonprofit sector. Community nonprofits provide essential services to over half a million individuals and families in Connecticut every year. They employ 14% of Connecticut's workforce, improving the quality of life in communities across the state. We respectfully request that the legislature increase funding by 461 million over five years for community nonprofits. Since 2007, community nonprofits have lost at least this amount in state funding that has not kept pace with inflation or adequately covered the increased costs and demand for services. We urge you to please consider the following recommendations. Number one, to commit to increasing funding by the full 461 million or 28% by fiscal year 2026. Number two, to appropriate 128 million in new funding for community nonprofits in fiscal year 2022 a 7% increase and a state net of 67 million after federal reimbursements. Number three, to increase to, in, to increase to, infl, in, I'm sorry, to in, index the increases to inflation to ensure that state funding will keep pace with increased costs in the future. And finally, to hold nonprofits financially harmless um, as a result of the impact of COVID-19. Um, you have my written testimony before you, um, which provides quite a lot of detailed information regarding the impact of the pandemic upon the um, sector and also specifically the impact um, as it relates this evening to DO, DECD and DOH funded providers. And I'd like to highlight just a few points if I may. Um, with regard to the Department of Housing um, proposed budget, we ask that you please oppose the reduction in the governor's budget to housing and homeless services by 3 million in each fiscal year and increase funding in that line item to reflect the increased funding for providers as referenced just a few minutes ago. This line item provides funding for a variety of critical housing and homelessness services and supports, including the rental assistance program, as well as frontline homeless services, outreach to unsheltered individuals and emergency shelters. Um, 
and to, um, to highlight just a few points within the DECD budget. Um, my testimony outlines both the um, ways in which the creative economy um, is essential to Connecticut, but also the ways in which the pandemic has devastated Connecticut's creative economy. And you've heard from so many of our members just this evening about the impact and um, we are so proud of them. What a great job they've done in their testimony. Um, my, my testimony outlines six, six different um, recommendations, um, but first and foremost, we ask that you please support the Tourism Funds Grant as proposed by the governor, which transfers resources from the general fund of 9.8 million in fiscal year 21 and 3.1 million in fiscal year 22. Julia, uh -huh. please. Absolutely, to maintain the tourism fund. Um, again, you have my written testimony and I would um, simply like to point out that the testimony does include the white paper of the Alliance that outlines that 461 million um, request for increased funding, as well as the US Bureau of Economic Analysis report on Connecticut's creative economy. And thank you so very much for your time. Thank you. And thank you for your advocacy and thank you for testifying tonight. Thank you. Um, next, we have Dan McFadden. Hi, Dan. Go right ahead, sir. Uh, yes, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Dan McFadden. I'm with Mystic Seaport Museum, and I'm here to speak uh, in support of increased uh, funding for arts, culture, and tourism. Um, you know, most of us don't think of Connecticut necessarily as a mecca for tourism, but our proximity to New York and Massachusetts in particular makes us an easy to reach destination for millions of people. And as the region exits the pandemic, Connecticut is, a, is perfectly positioned to be a destination for these people when they think about their vacation, which they're all doing now. And what we need to do is convince them that Connecticut is the place they want to go when they get in their car for the first time for that trip coming up this spring and summer. Um, but we need the state to help us market the state. Um, in our museum, more than half of our uh, visitors come from out of state. Uh, many of them, the majority of them come from New York metro area and Massachusetts. Um, unfortunately, uh, New York City and Boston are two of the most expensive media markets in the country. Uh, that makes it difficult for individual businesses of any size really to buy into these key areas, ourselves included. Uh, this is where the state effort is crucial. Um, by advertising, where others in the state ourselves can't do this, the Commission on Tourism can uh, build awareness for the state and drive visitation. It's an essential component of growing tourism for the state. Um, Connecticut, unfortunately, lags behind our neighbors. Uh, New York City budgets something north of $60 million for, for their annual tourism funding. Uh, Rhode Island actually had more than double what we did last year, and that's Rhode Island. So this is, we need to be in, this marketing game with the other states, because if we don't do it, they will have our lunch uh, and take it take it from us. So um, I really do urge you to please uh, support this funding. Um, it is funded by the hotel tax, so it should be sustainable. We see that as a good investment, because if we do grow tourism, we grow revenue, and that goes into the general fund, so it's a win-win for everybody. So uh, thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to give testimony. Thank you, sir, and thank you for your testimony. Have a good evening. You too, thank you. Jack, Jacqueline Corral. Jacqueline Corral. Madam not Minister. present. Oh, I'm sorry, not present? Okay. Jane, Jane Garibay. Good evening. Good evening, distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Um, I'm Jane Garibay, and I'm here to testify today in favor of an item appropriation to the Connecticut Main Street Center. As a legislator representing two historic and dynamic downtown centers, supporting our state's main streets and small businesses are key priorities. Additionally, as one of the co-founders of the Main Street Working Group at the Capitol, I can attest to the great work that the Connecticut Main Street Center does in their quest to empower downtown communities. The Connecticut Main Street Center is committed to supporting small businesses and as someone who has directed the Chamber of Commerce and Main Street programs in my hometown, I can tell you that resources for organizations like CMSC go a long way 
when it comes to creating a downtown environment in which our small businesses can succeed. Whether it be improving streetscapes or ensuring that new and diverse businesses have the guidance to succeed and promote themselves, this organization makes a difference when it comes to the vitality and success of their member towns throughout the state. When done right, downtown development is about so much more than the facts and figures associated with economic success. By adequately funding CMSD, we have an opportunity to ensure that downtown revitalization is done through a localized lens. Windsor and Windsor Locks have put a lot of effort into recently supporting the development and success of women-owned, minority-owned, and veteran-owned small businesses and much of that success has been due to the infrastructure and support provided by the CT Main Street Center. Their ability to assist in the financing that supports downtown success, such as through tax increment financing and provide the resources that increase branding and promotion of the downtown as a whole has freed up these businesses and allowed them to survive and thrive. It goes without saying that all of these resources will be even more important as we deal with the task of revitalizing our downtown in a post-pandemic world. I wholeheartedly support an annual $350,000 line item appropriation to the Connecticut Main Street Center. Enhancing downtown development means strengthening Connecticut, supporting small business, providing jobs and quality of life. And that is something that we can all rally behind. And I'm sorry, I forgot to put on my camera. And when I looked up as I was going, I was, couldn't do two at the same thing. Thank That's, you for your time this evening. Thank you. And thank you for testifying. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> okay. Kelly Ann Day. Good evening, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony tonight. My name is Kellyanne Day, and I'm the CEO of New Reach, an organization that's working to make homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. New Reach provides eviction prevention services, crisis services, including emergency shelter and housing. Last year, our organization alone served close to 4,000 men, women, and children in New Haven and Fairfield counties, all of which were either unstably housed or homeless. COVID has increased the need for our services and the pressure on our systems. For example, the length of stay at our shelters steadily climbed last year, peaking at 125 days for single women and 160 days for families last summer. The eviction moratorium has helped to decrease the length of stay for the last quarter of 2020, but we know that when it is lifted, the pressure will increase. As a member of the statewide Reaching Home campaign to prevent and end homelessness in Connecticut, having served on that body for a variety of capacities since its inception in 1999, I'm also an active member of CCEH and the Connecticut Nonprofit Community Alliance. The importance of safe, affordable, and permanent housing cannot be understated. Are we a state that considers a home and a roof over, overhead something that only the privileged deserve? I hope not. When our state's residents have stable housing, their economic and health incomes improve, their health outcomes improve, children's health, both physical and mental, improves, as do their educational outcomes. During COVID-19, the need for permanent housing for all of Connecticut residents has become even more important. I respectfully request that the committee support the following. The homelessness line item at $85.5 million, reinstating the $3 million the governor proposed to cut from this line item. And to be honest, $85.5 million does not cover the cost that housing and homeless providers incur to provide these life-saving services. And we definitely cannot afford a $3 million cut this year. Also, please support funding for the DOH homeless youth line item at $2.6 million and $2.94 million in fiscal years 22 and 23, respectively. In addition to these line items, I urge you to support the following additional investments. 2.3 million in specific funding for coordinated access networks. These CANs are providing coordination and structure to a system that allows for greater efficiency and collaboration between nonprofit providers, which in turn allows people in crisis to access appropriate care and housing quickly. 
We're not going to make homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring without affordable housing. According to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, Connecticut lacks almost 87,000 units of housing for low income residents. One way to immediately address this, this shortage is to invest $2 million in the Housing Homeless Services line to provide rental assistance for supportive housing units. The work that shelters and housing professionals do is critical to ending homelessness. And for years, community nonprofits who provide these services have not been paid the value of those services. I urge you to consider the Connecticut Nonprofit Community Alliance's proposal to restore 461 million to right-size the nonprofits who have not received increases in the past 10 years. Can, this can will I, add approximately 3 million. Yes. Can, I, can, you sum up, can you sum up please your over the three minute mark? Yes, I'm just about done. <laughs> I just up. want to say it's important to consider homeless providers as essential and they should be recognized and compensated for their incredibly dedicated commitment to showing up every day during a pandemic. Therefore, please support Senate Bill 340 for adequate funding for homeless housing providers. And in addition, I would like to just note that New Reach staff and board support the following bills, SB 86, SB 804, HB 6430, and HB 6431. Thank you to the committee for taking the time tonight to listen to my testimony, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, and thank you, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Barahona. Yes, good evening, thank you. And thank you, Representative Walker, for earlier, my colleague from Bridgeport testified as well for Cradle to Career Funding, and you uh, gave a shout out to the late Representative Santiago, and I appreciate that. Um, he was indeed a champion of our work, and I'm, I'm proud to be here tonight to tell you a little bit more about the good work we are doing. My name is Jennifer Barahona, and I'm the CEO of Norwalk Acts, which is the backbone structure for the Cradle to Career Collective Impact Movement in Norwalk. And we applaud the governor for restoring the $100,000 to the Department of Labor budget in support of Connecticut's four cradle to career communities. The funding supports community and resident leaders in Bridgeport, Norwalk, Stanford, and Waterbury working to advanced evidence-based strategies that support student and youth success and economic mobility with a focus on black and brown youth and those from lower income families. These four communities are members of the National Strive Together Network and follow the same collective impact approach that is rooted in the belief that no single organization or entity alone can create the large scale lasting social change on its own. The challenges our children and youth experience are bigger than any one sector can address and we have proven that we can achieve more working together than we can in silos. We operate using the same theory of action to convene cross-sector partners to adopt common goals, use data to drive decision-making, and engage those most impacted by current systems in determining what is best for their own communities. We represent the backbone structures of these cross-sector partnerships that are working to close opportunity gaps. Our work is truly cradle to career, encompassing early childhood, K-12 education, and college and workforce readiness. We work to strengthen the connections and transitions between the systems along that continuum. Each of our communities can highlight the successes as you heard with my colleagues in Bridgeport and we'll hear later in Stanford. But in Norwalk, this includes building an early childhood system that is being looked at as a national model. That includes a citywide approach for developmental screenings of children birth to five in preparation for kindergarten. We also partner with the district, city, and numerous community-based organizations to provide critically needed data support, including analyzing student data to optimize the distribution of food during the COVID crisis to make sure that mobile, mobile food sites were within walking distance to low-income students. We developed a disaggregated school improvement dashboard for the district to capture demographic assessment and testing data by schools so they can make better informed decision on instruction and created a disproportionality and equity dashboard highlighting under and over representation in subgroups and disciplines, special education and academically talented categories. Our collective impact approach has never been more important. When the pandemic hit, we were fortunate to have these existing structures that allowed us to really hit the ground running with our partnerships with municipalities, school systems, health departments, community-based organizations, philanthropy and more. However, the pan pandemic has created even further disparities in our educational health outcomes for low-income families and children of color. Our ability to continue to leverage these key partnerships and build unified strategies in our cities will be critical in the recovery. The funding from the state is a recognition of the importance and the need for our type of work to really align systems to meet these challenges. Furthermore, it's critically important in helping us attract other national 
public and private investments in our community, which the four of us have done to the tune of over $2 million in recent years. We're thankful to have legislators who understand the importance of our systems change work as we rebuild a more equitable post COVID community. We thank you for the support and hope it does not get line itemed out as it has in the past. And even though it's a small amount, it's very important for leveraging additional funding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you for your advocacy. And thank you for carrying on as Representative Santiago's whole, whole, fo whole focus. So thank you. Thank you. For thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next, Mandy Jackson. Hi, uh, thank you uh, for taking this time tonight. My name is Mandy Jackson. I'm the executive director of Music Haven. I know you've heard a few people testify for Music Haven. Uh, a year ago, we were here um, testifying to make sure that the line item that we had previously had added and funded um, in the 2019 budget year uh, was extended into the, the next budget year. Um, we had more than 30 people had submitted testimony. Um, we took a group of folks all the way to Hartford, waited four hours, testified. Um, a story that was written in the press after that hearing um, suggested that uh, uh, we had shut down the switchboards because so many people had called and emailed. We were assured our funding would be um, restored and then it didn't happen. I found out a week ago um, that we weren't in the budget. I thought that we were. I found out a week ago that we weren't. Um, and it was a pretty devastating blow considering what's been going on um, this past year. I've submitted testimony as have over 60 other people. And I just wanna be clear that we found out about this hearing three days ago and in three days, 60 people have submitted testimony in support of Music Haven. 12 to 15 others have sent me emails trying to say, how do I get this testimony in? Um, dozen, uh, more than a dozen parents and students submitted testimony um, and we're tired you're all tired. We're tired of fighting this every single year. So I'm not going to read my testimony. I'm going to just read this letter that I received from a student actually during the second hour of this meeting. It's a photo she took of a handwritten letter she wrote on school notebook paper. And it says, hello, I'm Jaylene. I go to Wexler Grant School and I'm in seventh grade. I've been attending Music Haven for two years now and I love the program. I love my teachers and peers. They've helped me, not just me, but my family as well. That's the truth for many of us through this pandemic. At Music Haven, we found another family. People who genuinely care about not only growing our musical abilities, but that also contribute to our lives. And I would love to say also how much I love my teachers. They never gave up on me and I'm truly grateful for them. Um, besides that, all I'd like to add is that um, as Gregory, one of our teachers said earlier, uh, Music Haven also wants to voice support for the domestic workers wage education and enforcement bill. All of these things are connected. So many of our children at Music Haven have parents, family members who are domestic workers and it impacts every single part of their life and their development and their ability to participate in our program and their development as musicians if they have their wages stolen, if they break their bodies doing their work and they have no recourse. Oh, I do wanna, I wanna also clarify, just to be clear, we are not asking for any new line item to be added. We were already included in the budget um, we are asking for that budget amount to be continued. We're not asking for a modest increase. We are asking for the $100 allocation that we had in 2019, 2020 to be in the budget for, for this year and the subsequent years as we were told it was going to be. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy, it's 100,000, not 100. That's what I said. Sorry, oh, that, I'm sorry. Thank you for the, I, I mean, wanna, 100, I would, be better, 100 would be better than zero, but thank you. I didn't want anybody to, to think that, oh, put a hundred dollars. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you for your advocacy and thank you for what you do. Thank you. Um, Bob Murdoch. Hi, um, good evening. Um, you know, thank you for this, for this opportunity to um, talk tonight. I'm here in support of the Department of Economic and Community, Community Development and specifically the tourism portion of their budget. Uh, my name is Bob Murdoch. I'm the president of the Connecticut Convention and Sports Bureau. We're Connecticut's only statewide meetings and events, sports events, sales and marketing organization. Our mission is to sell and market the state of Connecticut as a premier destination for national, regional, statewide group business, conventions and sporting events. So we're part of the tourism industry, but we're specifically going after groups. So conventions, trade shows, sporting events, you know, NCAA men's basketball, those kind of events. Uh, collaborating with the state. So um, we are 
Part of our funding comes through the Department of Community Development and specifically the Office of Tourism. And we do also get private support funding um, really to strengthen the arts, culture and tourism sectors of Connecticut. Additional resources are, are needed to be directed at the tourism fund. Um, and the tourism and hospitality industry, industries are net revenue generators for the state. Uh, funding that comes to, to tourism doesn't compete with other priority programs uh, out there. We are revenue generators. So it's, we're an investment for the state. Um, and again, as earlier speakers you know, talked about three to seven dollars of every, every dollar that is invested in tourism three to seven dollars comes back. So it really is an investment. So we can help pay for other programs. There's some great programs that we're talking about tonight. Uh, funding tourism is one method of actually generating income to support those events. So we stress that uh, you continue uh, to fund tourism. And, uh, you know, we've really been hit hard by COVID-19. You know, the hotel occupancy is, um, down 55% as compared to past years. So it's really investment in this sector is, is vital. Uh, restaurants, attractions, you know, we've heard lots of things, the arts, culture, all really affected by, um, uh, by COVID more than some of the other sectors have been. So this is really an investment in Connecticut. We are a revenue generator for the state and it's really a way to help bring in events. Uh, our organization works on large and small events, as I mentioned, one NCAA men's basketball first and second rounds, events that bring in people that stay here for multiple days, uh, stay in hotels, eat in restaurants, go to attractions, go to the casinos, go shopping, buy gasoline, uh, support a lot of different sectors. So we just, again, ask for your support uh, of tourism uh, in general. And um, we're also in support of House Bill 6119, which is uh, a bill that's out to increase the portion of the hotel sales tax that goes towards the tourism fund. So uh, again, it's an important sector. And again, we're, we're a revenue generator, love to support all the, all the really the great causes that are out there, some really important things that, that people have spoken about today. So thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. No problem. Thank, Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thanks, you too. Thank Stacy Cody. Yes, hi. Good evening, Representative Walker, Senator Austin, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Stacy Violanti Cote, and I am the director of the Homeless Youth Advocacy Project at the Center for Children's Advocacy. We're a private nonprofit law firm representing uh, vulnerable children and youth throughout the state. I know you've heard from us many times in, in front of uh, many of these committees. I um, am also chair of the Reaching Home uh, Campaign's uh, Youth and Young Adult Homelessness Task Group. Uh, I've submitted written testimony and um, I know that you'll have the opportunity to look at that. Uh, what I really wanna do to in this time is really just um, emphasize our support for the uh, Department of Housing, Homeless and Housing line item, and also particularly for the Department of Housing's Homeless Youth line item uh, at 2.65 million and uh, 2.94 million in fiscal years 22 and 23. Um, we really want to emphasize how important this line item is to the young people that are out there. I'm gonna give you just a little bit of data and then talk for a quick moment about the young people who we work with. On the data side, uh, we know from our partners at the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness who do the homeless youth outreach and count that as of uh, the count in 2020, we have an estimated 7,800 youth experiencing homelessness and housing instability in our state. That includes minors and that includes young adults. Of those, we have an estimated 2,462 who are experiencing literal homelessness, meaning on the streets, in the cars, in the shelters, in the case of some of my clients, in stairways, um, really literally homeless. Right now, the uh, homeless youth program funded by this line item has more than 300 youth on their wait list. 
more than 300 youth waiting for housing. At a time during a pandemic, what are these youth doing? They're moving from house to house. I, I know that I don't have to tell some of you, you work with them, you see them. They're going from couch to couch, house to house, exactly what we don't want young people or anybody doing during a pandemic. These youth are vulnerable. They need the services immediately. Some of the data also tells us that over 50% of them do not have a high school diploma. Over 50% are not employed. It's programs like this homeless youth program that connect them to housing, to critical services, to employment, all of these pieces that are gonna hold them up and keep them in a home, keep them safe, and keep all of us safe during a pandemic. I think of Michael, I think of Michelle, I think of Edwin, and I know they're going from couch to couch and it's impossible to look at their faces and say to them, we don't have a place for you to sleep tonight. So I, I think you know the importance of this work, but I can't help but come here to you tonight and share the names and the stories of these young people. So I appreciate your time and your support for these critical services. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you for, for coming tonight and talking to us. And thank you for your advocacy. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Fox. Hey, Sarah. You're, you're muted. You're muted. No, Sarah. Can't hear you. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Good evening, distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify. My name is Sarah Fox and I'm the Director of Policy at the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness. I speak today representing a broad coalition of more than 100 organizations across the state. who are all committed to a common goal of making homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. I've submitted written testimony but plan to focus on just a portion of it. I would like to preface my remarks by first sharing that of the many things our state has to be proud of, our work to address homelessness is at the top of the list. Communities across the country continue to look at our progress even throughout the pandemic and seek answers from us on how to end homelessness. We have proven that homelessness is solvable and requires focus, coordination across state systems, good data to inform and measure our progress, strong state and local partnerships, and investments in innovative and proven strategies. Together, we have made sure that your investments in the Homeless Response Network matter and result in positive outcomes, especially in times of crisis. Today, I stand in awe of the Herculean efforts still underway by our frontline providers and staff to keep homeless people safe and swiftly rehoused each and every day. Nonprofit homeless service organizations and the people who work for them have played a critical role in protecting and assisting Connecticut's most vulnerable populations. During the COVID-19 pandemic, emergency homeless services have been an important part of the state's critical infrastructure and emergency response system. But regardless of their essential role, homeless service organizations continue to be funded by state agencies at levels far below the actual cost of delivering services. Adequate funding is paramount to safeguarding the health and economic security of our frontline staff. The net effect of asking providers to maintain or in some cases do more with flat funding has been lower wages, lower morale, higher turnover, high vacancy rates amongst frontline staff, and too often our frontline staff are at or near homelessness themselves. The arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic saw these effects most acutely as homeless service organizations found themselves unable to fill staffing vacancies at a time when staffing needs were most urgent. We also know that frontline staff and those fulfilling these essential roles throughout the pandemic are disproportionately people of color. More must be done to protect these workers and their families. We must prioritize funding to homeless service organizations so that every employer is able to provide their staff with a safe working environment and a living wage. This would go a long way towards eliminating the racial and economic inequities that have become so glaring during this pandemic. We must act with shared responsibility to address this public health crisis. We must increase permanent housing options and pre prevent increases in homelessness. Now is not the time to tighten our budgets and halt our progress. We should not balance our state budgets on the back of the most vulnerable men, women, and children, or those who are playing essential roles on our front line of our state's homeless response system. 
Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to present this testimony and for your hard work making important and life-saving decisions during this public health crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming up and testifying all the time too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Got it. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. Ife Jordan. Ife? No, not present, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, uh, Leji, I, I can't, Davenport? <laughs> yes, that's okay. Um, my name is Ligia Davenport, and I hope all of you and your families are well. Thank you for this opportunity. At this time last year, I remember dismissing my students and packing my car. And after a long day's teaching at a New Haven public school, I drove the 45 plus minute commute and then waited several hours to testify before you about the importance of Music Haven. At that time, I came before you as a parent of three young musicians and as a board member. My testimony today is given from a different perspective, but has a more in-depth message. Because of the pandemic and having a medically fragile child at home, I had to pivot professionally. And as I made that shift, I came on board as a part-time staff member at Music Haven. Currently, I am the development associate. In this role, I have had the benefit of reading all of the wonderful messages that come from our donors, many of which state they wish they could do more at this time. Our giving has decreased and our number of new donors has also declined. What we have had, however, is consistent acknowledgement of being successful in our continuation and implementation of programming for our students. Our attendance rate has been consistently high, and the additional support that Music Haven provides has proven to be necessary, especially for our refugee families and our families that have dealt with loss. Families have lost income, homes, and even immediate relatives. And all the while grappling with these challenges amidst the pandemic, Music Haven has become the place that they feel most comfortable sharing their struggles. I believe that this is due to the longstanding commitment and relationships built within the program. And as I have stated in the past, Music Haven is not just free music lessons. It's so much more than that. It's consistency, reliability, and a symbol of hope. During this time, we have been able to keep our students engaged as well as our alumni. We have had a 100% acceptance rate to four-year colleges, which speaks volumes considering the rate at which our city struggles, not only with high school retention and graduation, but also college acceptance. New Haven's, excuse me, Music Haven's new College and Career Pathways program has enabled our alumni to stay connected, serve as role models, mentors, and teaching fellows for younger students this year. Not to mention those longstanding relationships provide a sense of security for them as well they know that they are still part of the Music Haven family. Funding is crucial to continue programming and th that has a lifelong impact on these young lives. Music Haven produces leaders, engaged community members, talented artists, and contributors to the state of Connecticut. I write this on behalf of the families that have lost members that would have written to you and came and testified if they were here today. I write this on behalf of the staff that works tirelessly behind the scenes to provide engaging programming and remain that constant in our young people's lives. I write this as a taxpayer that is proud of a program located in the heart of the community that it serves, bringing two worlds together to create opportunities. We have done our part to keep the music going during these challenging times and to provide the much needed social emotional support to our family and audiences. I ask that you provide funding to continue to keep this music going, and I invite you to one of our virtual programs until we are able to host you in person when it is safe to do so. Thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you for your, for your testimony. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, Joe Carbone. You get, you're muted, Joe. You're muted. Nope, you're still muted. There you go. Okay. Yep. Let me officially welcome all of you to my kitchen, which you can see in the back here. So welcome to my home. And thank you very much for having me tonight. And uh, I appreciate the time. Uh, I'm here to support the budget request from the, the Department of Labor in our state. Uh, I've given you three pages of testimony, which you can read. And part of it is uh, really heaping great praise on them for the way in which they handle the 
huge volume of people that were filing for unemployment benefits. But I'm really here tonight, as I've been here for several years, talking about long-term unemployment. Uh, it's defined officially as 27 weeks of being out of work. Once you pass that point, you become long-term unemployed. In the budget, it's called the Opportunities for the Long-Term Unemployed. It's a line that covers a program called Platform to Employment, which we created at the workplace. The workplace, by the way, is my employer. We're based in Bridgeport. And workforce development is our business. It's a program that served until now, prior to the pandemic. It was serving long-term unemployed people who were facing discrimination based upon age. It was also uh, working with people that were coming uh, through the re-entry program, and they were facing multiple barriers as well. And then we added another provision this year that was dealing with the veterans. So it was three different groups. It's a budget that was created in uh, 2000, 2019, prior to the pandemic. And I'm grateful to the General Assembly. I write you folks all the time, giving you updates on this program. Grateful for the governor for putting in the current funding level and uh, in the Connecticut Department of Labor. But I think we're at a point where I'm sort of asking you on behalf of long-term unemployed in our state. I think they're approaching a point where they need recognition and they need some solutions. Uh, there's over 200,000 people that are at risk of becoming long-term unemployed. That's a number that is greater than we experienced during the Great Recession. The burden for carrying long-term unemployment right now is on the backs of the poorest among us. I send out often one of these, it's a, and it displays the clips, the point in which people's benefits will uh, actually be expiring. And here's the thing, even if there's extensions, uh, it does not change the basic dynamics. People will still reach a point where they'll expire their benefits and remain out of work. That number is over 200,000, it's gonna happen. But 65% of that group are people that in 2019 made $35,000 a year or less. They're the poorest among us. More than 55% are female. Uh, some 47% are people age 40 or under. Some 33% have nothing but a high school diploma. It is disproportionately African-American and Latino. Uh, and there are people that will come on to the long-term unemployment role in short order. They need our help. The number that's now at 203,000 that I'm just talking about was about 187,000 a few weeks ago. When the jobs report came out for January, we had lost 3,400 jobs in the month of December and they revised the job losses for the previous month to be even worse. We have to help these folks. And you guys have been wonderful to this program uh, and to long-term unemployed since the Great Recession. And as I said, I'm very, very grateful for it. I need your help, not only to secure the amount that's in the budget, but to think about it in terms of that's the number in 2019 when the economy was surging. It's not the number anymore. More support is needed to help people. We already know that issues like domestic violence are up, that drug use is up, that alcoholism is up. You know, all of the things that will fall into the regional safety are there. There's a difference from being out of work for 10 weeks and being out of work for what will be, in many cases, more than a year. Uh, there's a difference. And that difference is the mind. We deal with that with platform to employment. We deal with it well. 80% of the people that come through that program end up employed. And they end up employed in private sector jobs making almost 50,000 a year. It makes it an investment in that every time we help somebody, we make a taxpayer for the state of Connecticut. And in a year and a half paying taxes, they're gonna pay you back what it costs for the program. But they're Americans. There are brothers and sisters, there are neighbors, they need to hear and they need to see that people care about them and there are solutions to help them. I'm grateful to all of you, by the way, most of you have come to our orientations 
or our graduations or been part of our program forever. And I'm really eternally grateful. And so I'm here to support the budget, but ask you to give careful consideration to increasing that line, given the number of people that are now long-term unemployed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for your work. And thank you for keeping us on our toes. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Um, Judith Deham. Judith? Judith? Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Buenas noches. Gracias por esta oportunidad. Mi nombre es Judith Paz Deham. Eh, yo represento comunidades sin fronteras en Orwell y trabajadoras domésticas del hogar. Uh, perdón, Judith, ¿me de ¿podrías dar una pausa después de cada frase para yo traducir? Perfecto. Ok, I'm going to translate, my name is Megan Fountain, I'm going to translate for Judith de Ham. Uh, she said, good evening. She is a representative of Communities Without Borders and the Domestic Workers Coalition. Adelante. Yeah, gracias. Mi testimonio es acerca um, eh, de mi trabajo. Tengo un negocio de limpieza de casas. Tengo tres empleadas. En la pandemia me vi afectado porque no tuve trabajo por tres meses. So I want to give you a testimony about my work. I have a cleaning company and I have three workers in my cleaning company. And during the pandemic, we had no work for three months. Uh, doy gracias a Dios porque algunos clientes nos pagaron, otros no. Y cuando el, el gobernador Lamont dijo que podíamos regresar, regresamos, pero algo otros clientes no regresaron. Mi trabajo también se ve afectado porque se redujeron las horas de trabajo. So I give thanks to God because during the shutdown, some of our clients paid us and others did not. When Governor Lamont gave the order to reopen uh, businesses, uh, we did, but some of our clients um, did not did not rehire us. Um, so we have very reduced work hours. Uh, lo otro es que en, en este trabajo nosotros no tenemos días de enfermedad, no tenemos derecho a vacaciones, no tenemos seguro médico. Uh, pienso que mi... I'm sorry, Megan. Diga. Um, in this kind of work, we have no paid sick days, we have no vacation, we have no health insurance. Pienso que mi trabajo es fundamental porque es impo importante mantener las casas limpias, es parte de una higiene. I think that my work is essential because we keep houses clean. Um, um, y otro es, mi, mi pregunta es, ¿cómo podemos hacer para que los clientes nos paguen más, así como yo, que contrato personas para trabajar, um, por la limpieza de la casa? Porque siempre es el mismo costo por la limpieza de la casa y ya teniendo varios años con ellos. And my question is, how can we um, have our customers pay more because year after year, um, what we earn is the same and um, I have workers to pay in my cleaning company. Yo pienso que tenemos que tener un aumento por determinado tiempo, porque así nosotros podemos darle un aumento a las, a las personas que tenemos, darles un beneficio, porque esto es una cadena. Si yo recibo un beneficio, puedo dar un beneficio de igual manera. Así como a mí, mis clientes me pagaron, yo le pagaba las horas a las muchachas también. Entonces, eh, um, necesitamos la ayuda de ustedes y gracias por esta reunión que, es así, que ha sido muy, muy larga, muy extensa. Um, gracias por escucharnos. 
So I think we need to work together to raise the wages and wage and raise the standards. Um, the the clients and the employers and the employees and the state can work together to raise the wages and wage, raise the labor standards for domestic workers. Um, I want to thank you for your support. It's been a very long meeting, and I'm very grateful that you've listened to all of us. Good night. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, thank you, Judith, for your testimony, and thank you, Megan, for your inter for for your translations. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Amy Blaymore Patterson. Good evening, Representative Walker. So just this, Senator Austin, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, my name is Amy Blaymore Patterson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Land Conservation Council, which is the umbrella organization for the state's land conservation community, including its approximately 130 land trusts. I want to thank you for this opportunity to present testimony in support of HB 6439, outlining the governor's proposed budget. Uh, I attended Commissioner Dyke's excellent presentation this morning and also submitted written testimony, so I will be brief and just quickly touch on a few points raised during that meeting. First, regarding the Community Investment Act, as I say in my written testimony, we are grateful to Governor Lamont for continuing to protect and fully fund the CIA, which as you know, provides a consistent source of dedicated funding outside the budget for investments in open space, farmland, dairy support, historic properties, and affordable housing programs in communities across the state. Um, this morning, Senator Austin had raised the question about CIA funds and their use for open space. I wanna add that in addition to funding the Open Space and Watershed Land Acquisition Grant Program, which provides matching funds for land trusts, municipalities and water companies for land acquisition, the CIA is also the only source of funding for DEEP's Urban Green and Community Garden Program, which provides financial assistance to targeted investment and distressed communities for the development of community gardens and green space projects. Uh, the CIA also funds two staff positions in land and acquisition management. And as always, I'm happy to answer any questions about that program, uh, which is essential, of course, to the Open Space Grant Program and, and community projects across the state. Um, secondly, regarding the Passport to Parks Program, in my written testimony, I noted that the budget shows expenditures for the Passport Program exceeding revenue, uh, but it isn't clear why. And uh, this morning, uh, Senator, Senators Minor and Kushner raised concerns about shifting expenses to the program. And um, we agree and we ask that the committee dig down deeper on the issue in the working session. Uh, we also ask that the committee consider the fix proposed by the Connecticut Forest and Park Association, which Eric Hammerman testified uh, as to earlier. Uh, likewise, regarding revenue for DEEP, as we note in our testimony and also raised this morning by uh, Senator Winfield and others, we would also ask the committee get further insight into how proposed decreases in the environmental conservation budget, as well as the um, concerning loss of 12 full-time positions will impact the agency's ability to implement core environmental conservation programs and uphold its enforcement and other essential, essential responsibilities. Finally, at a time when significant match dollars are anticipated, um, and this was alluded to uh, both by uh, Robert LaFrance from Audubon, Eric, Eric Hammerling, um, as well as Save the Sound, and of course in our testimony, it's essential that DEEP has the capacity to fully realize the benefits of these funds, which we anticipate are going to increase, and we just cannot be in a position where we leave these valuable federal dollars on the table. Uh, in closing, as the commissioner and so many of you noted there this morning, there's never been a time when the public's need for access to our state parks, wildlife management areas, trails, forests, et cetera, has been more important and impactful. And it is essential that DEEP has the staff and funds it needs to protect our environment, our public health, and our economic well-being. So thank you for this opportunity, as always, to, pro to provide you with our comments. And, and thank you especially for all you do. Have a terrific night. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for your testimony and your advocacy. <clears throat> Have a good evening. Thank you. Um, Bridget Fox. Yes. Good evening, Representative Walker and members of the committee. My name is Bridget Fox. I am president of Stanford Cradle to Career, and I want to thank you all for your commitment and service to the state. I am going to be very brief tonight because my 
wonderful colleagues, Shaheen Sneed from Bridgeport Prospers and Jennifer Barahona from Norwalk Acts spoke earlier this evening about the House Bill 6439 and the funding of $100,000 in this year's budget for cradle to career collective impact organizations across the state. So I will just refer you to my written testimony and their wonderful comments that really captured the role that our collective impact organizations are playing in the four communities and cities that we serve across the state and especially the role we've played throughout COVID and hopefully through the recovery process as the next year unfolds. So again, thank you very much for your time tonight, your commitment, and actually my colleague David will be next to speak a little bit more about the work we're doing in Connecticut, but thank you for your consideration. Thank you, thank you, Bridget. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. David? I am David Radcliffe of Hamden and serve as the statewide policy director for the Connecticut Cradle to Career Partnership. Uh, we applaud the governor for restoring $100,000 to the Department of Labor budget and support Connecticut's four cradle to career initiatives in Norwalk, Bridgeport, Stanford, and Waterbury. Our projects improve educational life outcomes and economic mobility for children and their families, especially in communities of color and those with lower incomes. Based on our experience and evaluation of our work, the cradle to career approach promotes innovative creative thinking system building that leads to align action with diverse community partners, community and resident leadership, and cost-effective community building practices with greater efficiency. Our areas of focus include infant health, kindergarten readiness, third grade reading, high school completion, reduced exposure to violence and trauma, post-secondary enrollment and completion, and youth employment. Our teams, as Bridget noted, have been very involved in providing important support during the COVID pandemic. To accelerate progress, continued investment in these four initiatives is essential. The funding allows local teams to build and fortify the local civic infrastructure through coordination and facilitation, data gathering and interpretation, and consistent communications. It's also worth noting these three points. One, investing in the human capital of our places is a necessary ingredient in COVID recovery. Times that demand coordinated community leadership focused on shared interests. Two, bolstering this work is a service to important efforts like the Governor's Workforce Council that benefit from the wisdom and power of organized cross-sector local leadership and engagement with diverse residents. And three, in the past, state funding has leveraged significant dollars from the private sector and philanthropy. Finally, of the 35 states in the country where there are cradle to career efforts, there's only one other state in the country investing in this work. With your leadership, we can show the country that our state recognizes the value of investing in this important local infrastructure. With that, I thank you for supporting this budget item and for your commitment to supporting Connecticut's children, families, and economic recovery. Thank you, David. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for staying and have a good evening. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Tina Tyson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to you, your fellow co-chair, and all the members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Tina Tyson, and I'm here from the Maritime Aquarium at Norwalk. I thank you for the opportunity to speak regarding proposed House Bill 6439. Our organization also submitted written testimony in collaboration with Mystic Aquarium. And much like Steve Cohen from Mystic Aquarium began, I wanna begin by reiterating our appreciation to the committee, to the General Assembly and to the governor for the financial support that each organization has received in the past. It's been vital to our organizations and to the communities that we serve. And while we're grateful to be a line item in the proposed budget, I, much like Steve Cohen, want to share with you more about how the pandemic poses a critical moment when we truly need additional financial support. I'll elaborate on that need using the experiences of the Maritime Aquarium. Whether we are open or closed, our expenses remain largely fixed. We must always keep our facility operating to assure that the, our animals are properly cared for. We cannot shut down our exhibits because they are living exhibits, nor can we easily transfer animals to other organizations because of regulatory restrictions. Thus, despite being closed to the public for nearly 100 days, 
we provided round the clock care for the more than 7,000 animals that call the Maritime Aquarium home. Similarly, despite the challenges of COVID-19, we did not waver in our commitment to the community. As the country shut down last March, the need for engagement and connection became acute. Immediately, we instituted a virtual aquarium that grew to include live question and answer sessions, keeper talks, virtual activities, and even an instructor-led meditation with our jellyfish. By summer's end, more than three million views worldwide enjoyed the aquarium from the comfort of their homes. Most importantly, affirming our commitment as one of Connecticut's leading providers of STEM education, Last March, we quickly transitioned our in-person classes for schools into a suite of live online instructor-led programs. Since the outbreak and through the summer, our education team delivered more than 300 virtual STEM programs to schools located throughout Connecticut, especially in underserved communities. Collectively, more than 20,000 children in 43 states and across countries on four continents participated in those virtual STEM programs. And those continue today. In fact, just last week, students from Turkey learned about sharks using one of our virtual programs. We reopened in June and families are beginning to return, but we still have significant operating deficits. We implore this committee to consider increasing the appropriated support for our institution and for Mystic Aquarium to continue to fulfill our mission to our animals, our communities, and to the state of Connecticut. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kylie Gosselin. Hello, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kylie Goslin. I'm the executive director of the Partnership for Strong Communities. Thanks for sticking it out tonight. I'm happy to be here with you. Um, I live in Hartford. I'm here to testify on House Bill 6439, the state budget for the biennium. For those of you who don't know, the partnership is a state policy and advocacy organization dedicated to ending homelessness and expanding housing opportunity here in Connecticut. And for more than 15 years, we've been bringing partners together around two collective impact campaigns, Reaching Home, dedicated to ending homelessness, and Home Connecticut for affordable housing. Each of those campaigns has brought forth a consensus agenda, including some of the items that I'll highlight tonight. I've provided more detail in my written testimony. Other budget items, including provider funding, which some others have mentioned here, we'll be discussing more at the Demas budget hearing in a couple of weeks. So first, as others have noted, I wanted to cite the uh, support we've requested for the DOH Housing and Homeless Services line item at 85.5 million and a request that uh, you all restore the $3 million cut that the governor proposed to this line. As you know, the cut represents lapse funding. Uh, the, the commissioner and her staff went into uh, what, what that funding, that lapse funding is. We ask that you consider repurposing that funding for rental assistance payment, uh, rental assistance program payments. The state RAP program provides flexible, mobile, affordable housing to our state's low-income residents that adjusts with income. RAPs are the most cost-effective type of affordable housing that we can provide and supports the open rental housing market as well as property owners. The wait list is currently closed for this program and new funding is needed. So rather than cut this funding, some of which was for LAPS RAPs for other programs, we request that you please consider repurposing it, especially during these critical times uh, in the pandemic when we are in desperate need of those permanent housing options. Uh, and second, for the same reason, our Home Connecticut campaign is seeking an additional $20 million for our state RAP program. Third, we're seeking a new line item in the DOH budget for CAN funding. Uh, this was mentioned by prior speakers. This is $2.3 million. And this item we've been requesting for three years. The CANs are amazing. They are our front door to our homeless service system. It's a nationally recognized system, as Sarah Fox noted. Um, but they're currently funded through an unstable combination of philanthropic funds and CIA funding. Uh, we need to ensure that they have stable funding so that they have the staffing that they need. So intake appointments for those experiencing homelessness are as quick as possible. Uh, fourth, we ask you consider investing an additional $2 million in supportive housing in our state. Supportive housing is a known cost-effective solution for ending homelessness, especially for those with high needs and is one of the reasons our state has seen success in reducing homelessness. 
Our data indicates that we need more of these units in order to get to the finish line. Fifth, uh, as Stacy Vilante Cote noted, we're asking you to support the funding in the governor's budget for the DOH homeless youth line item. The additional funding there represents a match for a federal grant that we as a state should be proud to receive in the amount of $6.5 million over the last couple of years. So that uh, several hundred dollars in increased funding will leverage 6.5 million for our homeless youth in the state, which is critically needed as Stacy detailed very eloquently. Could you sum up please, Kylie? Yep, and then finally, we're requesting uh, that you consider setting aside additional funds for rental relief for COVID. We know there's a significant amount of federal funding, however, in the amount of 235 million. However, our estimates as well as Federal Reserve Bank and other estimates uh, put Connecticut's rental need during the pandemic at closer to 500 million. So as we move forward, even with the resources we have, uh, I would implore you to consider trying to set aside additional funding uh, for you. that purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, Lisa Tepper Bates. Lisa, I don't see her on here. No, he's not present. Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Fitzmaurice. Daniel. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good evening. Uh, I'm Daniel Fitzmaurice. My pronouns are he, him. I'm the executive director of the Arts Council of Greater New Haven, which is located on the traditional land of the Wappinger, Pogasset, and Quinnipiac people. I join my colleagues in enthusiastically hoping you will support the governor's budget proposal to refill the shortage in the tourism fund during this critical time for our industry in our state. As you know, the tourism fund is a special fund that invests a portion of hotel occupancy taxes into the arts, culture, and tourism industries. Additionally, I hope that your budget proposal will adopt key aspects of House Bill 6119 to further strengthen the tourism fund. This would mean adjusting the name of the tourism fund to the arts, culture, and tourism fund, and to specify that this fund invests 40% into arts and culture and 60% into tourism. House Bill 6119 and other bills moving through the process would also increase the amount of funding allocated to the tourism fund. If that happens, I hope your budget will maintain level investment for direct line item earmarks that go to individual organizations, but please do not add any new earmarks or increase their funding even modestly. Instead, I hope you will invest additional dollars added to the tourism fund with the statewide agencies. That would be Connecticut Office of the Arts, Connecticut Office of Tourism, and Connecticut Humanities, so they can provide strategic support to help our industry through this pandemic. Last but not least, please reinstate Music Haven's funding. That's why I'm virtually at Music Haven's headquarters in Fairhaven. Though these direct line item earmarks are not a standard or equitable practice for investing in arts organizations, until the structure is improved, Music Haven depends on the support because all of their programs are provided at absolutely no cost to the low income black and brown children in New Haven they serve. They are the only organization that receives a direct line item earmark that prioritizes anti-racism and cultural equity in everything they do. They are also the only arts organization that has ever been treated this way by the Appropriations Committee. I hope you will quickly confirm your commitment to their families and provide Music Haven annually with $100,000 per year in both your fiscal year 22 and 23 budgets. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good to see you. Thank you for, for your advocacy also for all the other arts. Have a good evening. Um, Malachi Eason. Yes, good evening, everybody. My name is Malachi Eason. I'm the Director of Programming and Community Impact for the New Haven International Festival of Arts and Ideas. And I'm here today to testify in support of funding for the arts and culture institutions in Connecticut. I know you guys heard it all tonight, but I just wanna make sure I don't start off without saying thank you to the conservative, um, conserva uh, Conservation and the Development Subcommittee for your time today. The International Festival of Arts and Ideas has enjoyed a long and strong partnership with the state of Connecticut. And for that, we are extremely grateful. Your support from the state provides the festival with much needed resources to provide a diverse array of programming and activities throughout New Haven, bringing tourism dollars to the region and enriching the statewide economic system. 
The arts and the free exchange of ideas brings people together to celebrate successes, strengthen relationship, enhance communication, and increase awareness of issues that affect us all. The festival employs more than 180 people each summer and engages hundreds of more volunteers throughout the community. The festival also provides paid opportunities for artists and speakers throughout Connecticut, something that is vital in order to assist people as we are weathering these challenging times together. The festival is one of the only institutions of its kind in the world that offers such a variety and depth of programming, free of cost, ensuring that every person who desires to attend is welcome to attend without barriers. Um, before I close, I want to say that, you know, the arts changes the narrative. Um, I think of the times where my grandmother and my mom was all going through things and marching and things like that. There was one thing that was consistent throughout that time, and that was the arts. And I know for sure that that's the one thing that's going to change the times that we're in right now. So as you continue to help fund and help and be consistent and keep us at the front of your mind as you're planning, um, just know that you are changing hearts, you're changing minds, you're changing reality and futures of our youth. So thank you so much for all the things and support that you've done. And I hope to continue to have this relationship with you guys and that you guys think about um, the arts and culture institutions in the state of Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you, Malachi. Thank you for your, your testimony and your advocacy. Have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, Fernando Alvarez. Not present, Madam Chair. Uh, Margaret Middleton. I see her. Margaret. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you so much, uh, Co-Chair Austin, Co-Chair Walker, for having me this evening. My name is Margaret Middleton. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Columbus House. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we help very low-income people uh, move into safe and secure affordable housing in New Haven, Middlesex, Hartford, and New London counties. Um, I know that my colleagues have talked a lot tonight about um, many agenda items. I wanna talk to you about something that's really specifically important to Columbus House. Um, I'll tell you a brief story that sort of sums up why this is important. I was at the hotel this morning, which is where Columbus House was helping facilitate the vaccination of 100 people experiencing homelessness. And I was talking to the residential supervisor at Columbus House this morning who was uh, helping to coordinate that effort. And I was touched and impressed by her professionalism, her compassion for her clients, and the role that she was playing in maintaining the public health of our community. Um, this is a person who's been receiving hazard pay thanks to uh, federal funding that Columbus House has at this moment. And the reality is that our organization faces a funding cliff on June 30th where that hazard pay ends. And we have people who are doing essential work in our community who will go back to making minimum wage. Um, these are workers who are largely um, African-American men and women um, who are so important to our community that they've been prioritized to be vaccinated. Um, we call them essential, but we need to recognize their work that way. And that's why I would ask you to not only increase the homeless services budget item, budget line in the Department of Housing budget, but also look at uh, Senate Bill 340 which asks for a structural change in the way the contracts for homeless services are um, conceptualized and negotiated because we aren't currently compensated for the value of the work that we provide to our community. Um, we are funded based on sort of a historical amount of money that we were given at some time. And um, at this point, I think COVID has really made clear that Homeless services are providing an essential crisis response in our communities that's essential to public health. It's essential to our sense of morality and dignity as a state. Um, and that we're providing this as a professional service and not a kind of, um, you know, voluntary, um, a voluntary something happening, you know, in a, in a basement of a church somewhere. This is a professional service that's done by, by professionals. And they deserve to be paid. I hope so. I hope you'll consider that um, unsolicited plug for Music Haven. Not uh, off the cuff. Didn't mean to come here to talk about Music Haven. But when I heard my colleagues 
I've lived in New Haven for a long time and it's, um, it's an essential, essential part of the fabric of our community. If you've never been to one of their concerts and seen those kids with a stringed instrument, you don't know what you're missing. Um, so I very much hope that you'll restore their funding. Thank you so much. Thank you and have, have a good day. Thank you for your testimony and your advocacy. Thank you. Um, Daniel Cheeseboro. Yes, thank you so much. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm the first selectman of the town of Stonington and I'm here tonight to ask for you to consider increasing revenue to the tourism fund, which would be renamed the Arts, Culture and Tourism Fund going forward when hopefully House Bill 6119 is passed later this year. I also again, just wanted to reiterate the thanks that everyone has for the public service you all do for our state. I very much appreciate the challenges you have before you, especially sitting here and hearing all of the um, many important priority areas of funding. But that is really partly why I wanted to speak on behalf of this appropriation. This aspect of the budget is unique in that it shouldn't compete with other priority programs, such as homeless services or open space conservation. It should actually help pay for them. Looking at Tourism First, um, a 2017 study on the economic impact of tourism in Connecticut found that each household in Connecticut would actually need to be taxed an additional $705 to replace the state and local taxes generated by visitors in 2017. Looking broadly across the nation, according to a study of the U.S. Travel Association in 2013, travel and tourism generated over $60 billion in tax revenues to state and local governments. This was enough to cover the wages of all police officers and firefighters in the nation or salaries of nearly 100% of secondary school teachers in all 50 states. A 2012 study the state actually put forward also further emphasized that the more we increase our tourism funding, the stronger our return on investment gets. And it simply concluded that the tourism fund was clearly a revenue generator and not a cost to taxpayers. Taking a deeper look at arts and culture, according to a 2017 Arts and Culture Economic Prosperity 5 study conducted by Americans for the Arts, which examined fiscal year 2015, found the industry generated nearly 800 million in annual economic activity in the state and supported over 23,000 full-time jobs. Um, but honestly, tourism is so much more than that. Um, it's really about quality of life. And that's really why we're all here. And just to close, one of the things that we really love about this line item is that um, it supports cities as well as small towns and villages. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I laugh because we have many of legislators that go through the same thing. <laughs> Senator, Senator, uh, Senator Winfield and, and a variety of others. And it was funny to see everybody's face start to crack up because we know exactly where you are. So thank you for your testimony. And thank you for hanging in there despite the, the, the world crashing behind you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> have a good evening. Thank you. Um, Glenn uh, Lar Lungarini? Lungarini? Yes, uh, good evening. And thank you for the opportunity to testify at the end of a long evening for you. My name is Glenn Lungarini. I am the executive director of the Connecticut Association of Schools and the Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference. CASIAC represents approximately 1,000 public and parochial elementary, middle, and high schools in Connecticut. I am submitting testimony on HB 6439 to request consideration for the addition of an appropriation of funds to support student leadership programs offered by CAS CIAC. We request consideration for funding in the amount of $210,000 to $350,000, which would be added to the DECD Conservation and Development section. Our request for new funding aligns with and is proportional to current per participant funding currently appropriated to the Nutmeg Games in line T922 of the governor's proposed budget. Similar to the Nutmeg Games, CAS CIAC is a 501c3 organization that serves the K-12 student population. Our programming reaches far beyond the more than 70,000 student athletes who participate in interscholastic athletics on an annual basis. CAS CIAC engages K-12 students in leadership development and recreation programs that cultivate each child's cognitive, physical, social, emotional, and mental well-being. Our programming aligns with the State Department of Education and State Board of Education goals of promoting student voice and developing innovative critical thinking problem solvers. 
In appropriating funding to CASIA AC, you will positively impact student-centered leadership experiences across the state that span the K-12 grade levels, reach urban, suburban, and rural districts, while addressing Connecticut's opportunity gap by providing equitable access to exceptional student-centered leadership and growth mindset experiences. A list of CASIA AC's 12 student leadership and engagement programs, as well as a short video link that highlights the impact of those programs is provided in my written testimony. In closing, I share that the CIAC was established in 1921. As we celebrate our centennial year of service to Connecticut schools and the state's student athletes, we come to you for the first time in that 100 year span to ask for support. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, CIAC has provided a much needed virtual support community for Connecticut's kids. We have engaged students in meaningful learning experiences that have resulted in actionable change within our school communities at a time when social isolation and distance learning have led to increases in youth anxiety and depression. As CASIAC, a nonprofit organization, recovers from the COVID-19 pandemic, your funding will ensure that our valuable student-centered leadership programs continue to have a positive impact on Connecticut's youth. Thank you for your time this evening and your tireless work serving our great state. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for staying and thank you for your advocacy and your message. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs> Um, I want to thank everybody. I wait. Um, is there anybody? Is there anybody who did not get to testify that wants to testify? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. I want to thank everybody for hanging in there, and um, thank you for your support. And it's so much nicer, I have to say, the the fact that when we end this, it's not going to. I'm not going to get home an hour and a half later. So um, I will say that there are blessings in some of this. Okay, <laughs> I'm looking for small ones anywhere. Anyhow, thank you all for for hanging in there and have a good evening and uh, see you on Monday. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night, Madam Chair. Good job, Madam Chair. Thank you. Bye. Good, good work. Night. Good night, Madam Chair. Good night. Good night, good night all. Good job, everyone. Hi, Tony.